Good day, everyone. I'd like to welcome PCAST members and the public to a second public portion of this PCAST meeting. This is the first meeting of PCAST outside of Washington, DC in this administration. And we are in San Diego, uh, where in addition to these uh, public sessions, uh, we are taking doing a number of site visits to highlight the presidential administration's efforts in the area of climate change adaptation and mitigation. I wanna let everyone know that this meeting is public and it is being recorded. I'd also like to tell everyone that Arthi Prabhakar, the president's science advisor and a co-chair of PCAST, regrets that she is unable to join this meeting because she's participating in the G7 meeting in Japan this week. I'd now like to turn the program over to my co-chair, Francis Arnold. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we're very excited about today's discussions on generative artificial intelligence, and we're extremely grateful to our panelists for sharing their expertise regarding the benefits as well as limitations and challenges of this emerging capability. And I'm not going to introduce AI, I'd rather have the world experts who are here today do so. But we all know that generative AI is engaging and it's frighteningly adept at some things from summarizing ponderous academic studies to writing doggerel, from computer coding to composing music, art, even sequences of DNA for new biological functions, correctly or not. The speakers in this first session will discuss some of the ways in which AI tools are advancing scientific discovery to improve our understanding of the physical the natural world and to improve people's lives. The landscape of opportunities and risks is rapidly evolving. And we hope that today's discussion will broaden our understanding. So the bios of the three speakers in this first session are online at the PCAST website and in the PCAST members agenda book. Our first speaker, Dr. Anima Anand Kumar is Bren professor at Caltech and senior director of AI research at NVIDIA. She specializes in the areas of large scale machine learning, non-convex optimization and high dimensional statistics. Her algorithms enable and accelerate a range of scientific applications, including weather forecasting, autonomous drone flight, and even drug design. Second speaker, Dr. Demis Hassabis is co-founder and CEO of Google DeepMind, a world leading AI research organization, which has produced landmark breakthroughs such as AlphaGo, the first program to beat the world champion at the game of Go, and AlphaFold, which has been heralded as a solution to a grand challenge of predicting a protein's folded structure based on its amino acid sequence. And third, Dr. Fei Fei Li is inaugural Sequoia professor in the computer science department at Stanford University. She's also co-director of Stanford's human-centered AI Institute. And her current research interests include cognitively inspired AI, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, and AI with healthcare, especially ambient intelligent systems for healthcare delivery. So, Dr. Anand Kumar. Thank you, Francis. Um, it's an honor to be here. Next slide, please. Today, we are in the realm of generative AI, where we are able to generate new pieces of text from scratch, new images given text prompts, even new molecules given property specifications. What's different from the previous era of discriminative AI that was popular in the past decade is that back then we could only predict a property given an image or given a molecule. So generative AI is the inverse process, which is much harder and we are able to do that today. Next slide, please. So language models work by learning to predict the next word over a large corpus and then do that progressively to generate sentences and paragraphs. 
So we took the same philosophy to learn the language of the genomes, where we took all the known virus and bacterial genomes and trained a large language model on that. And after that, we wanted to focus on the coronavirus and see if we could predict new variants of concern. And to do that, we only trained on the variants of the first year and wanted to see if it could predict the variants after. Next slide, please. And you can see in this visualization during training time, it was given the alpha and beta variants. And then we asked it to generate new sequences and it successfully was able to predict new variants that emerge later, such as Delta and Omicron. And you see a visualization of the clustering of uh, variants that are similar in the latent space of the model. In addition, it also generated unknown variants that haven't yet emerged. And this is how we can be better prepared with better drugs and vaccines. Next slide, please. In order to understand how unknown variants impact the human body, we looked at its three-dimensional structure and the dynamic bond binding process with molecules in the human body. And such molecular dynamics are governed by mathematical equations and laws of physics. Such mathematical modeling is omnipresent, all the way from atomic scales to planetary scales and beyond. Next slide, please. For instance, in order to model the climate of this planet and look at climate change that can occur over the next few decades, we need to solve mathematical equations and do that at a very fine scale to capture the turbulence of the clouds. This is too expensive for current numerical simulation methods, even on the biggest supercomputers. Next slide, please. And this is where AI has a huge potential to speed up and learn better abilities to simulate. This can take advantage of accelerated computing such as GPUs and other hardware optimizations, as well as be able to harness large amounts of data that we have available and train large scale AI models. Next slide, please. And to this end, we developed an AI framework known as neural operators, where we can learn across different resolutions. And it can predict at resolutions higher than what was available during training time. This way, we can incorporate and learn physical effects at different scales. Next slide, please. We use this AI technique to learn on historical weather data and we were able to forecast medium term weather modeling and forecasting about 45,000 times faster than current models. Next slide, please. And with this speed up comes the ability to create larger ensembles that lead to better risk assessment and has a direct implication on human lives and economic costs as you see in this visualization of the hurricane where we can do different scenarios through ensembling. Next slide, please. In addition to the historical weather data, it was important to also incorporate domain knowledge and constraints such as the spherical geometry of the earth that enabled us to extrapolate beyond the training regime of medium term forecast to long stable rollouts. Next slide, please. And AI is also important for climate change mitigation. We used our neural operators to understand the complex multi-phase flow process of how carbon dioxide being pumped into wells with water would have pressure buildup and gas plume migration. And we were able to do this much faster than current numerical simulation techniques. Next slide, please. And our AI frameworks and neural operators have had an impact in a number of domains from uh, material deformation, studying the plasma evolution in nuclear fusion, ultrasound imaging. And we are able to do this much faster than current simulation and numerical methods. Next slide. 
And with that speed up comes the ability to design better systems. For instance, we designed a better medical catheter where we reduced bacterial contamination by about two orders of magnitude by preventing bacteria swimming upstream into the human body with a better geometric design. We also were able to enhance and improve for mask design in the lithography process that is an integral part of chip manufacturing. In all these scenarios, what you saw is the enormous ability for AI to do fast scientific modeling. And as part of the process, also be able to do inverse problems such as design directly in the vast design space and be able to incorporate a larger set of hypotheses. Next slide, please. I do think a foundation model for science will be enormously impactful. What we've seen so far is AI already making a huge impact in specific domains on specific modeling tasks. By combining data and domain knowledge across multiple domains, I do think we will be able to create a foundation model for science that will have a huge impact. Of course, that comes with also big computational needs. And I do hope we can provide that to the scientific community to enable us to move to the next realm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand Kumar. Our next speaker is Dr. Hassabis. Thank you, Francis. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here talking to you all. Is so, your uh, video on? Yes. Oh, OK. It should be. Great. Yes, now we have you. Thank Can you. Can you see me? Yes. <laughs> Great. So I spent my whole career working on AI because I believe in the incredible potential it has to help us solve some of the biggest challenges facing humanity today, from curing diseases to creating renewable energy sources of the future. But of course, because of its power, um, we also need to make sure we use it responsibly and handle it with exceptional care. Next slide. At the DeepMind, we started off working on AI um, using games, um, mostly because it was a very efficient way to explore uh, algorithms, general purpose algorithms and AI algorithms in an efficient way. And uh, as Francis mentioned in the introduction, probably our most famous program is called AlphaGo. Um, that was the first program to beat the world champion at Go in 2015. But not only did it win the match, um, it, it, the most importantly is it actually came up with new strategies never seen before, even though um, uh, we have played Go for thousands of years now and professionally for hundreds of years. So it's this kind of potential that I think is very exciting about this new uh, type of learning, uh, general learning AI. At the heart of all the systems that we've built um, and why they're so effective is that um, basically these systems, these AI systems learn a model of uh, the environment they're put in. So if that's a Go game, they learn a model of uh, Go positions and what kinds of moves are gonna likely to be good and therefore to look at. And that model is used to guide a search uh, a search or planning function. And because the model uh, models the environment very well, it allows this search to be very efficient. And that means we can uh, use these kinds of systems in situations where there are an enormous number of combinations. So for example, in Go, uh, there are around 10 to the power 170 possible positions in Go. So far too many positions for you to search uh, in a brute force manner. So it needed to have this kind of model to allow the search to be tractable and to allow AlphaGo to find these uh, amazingly strong moves and strategic ideas. Next slide. So the exciting thing now is that we're um, in the last few years, uh, the sophistication of these types of AI systems have got to the point where we can now apply it to important real world problems, um, especially, uh, and, and my particular passion is applying it to scientific problems to try and uh, accelerate scientific discovery. And the main first big problem we applied it to is called the protein folding problem. And proteins are essential to all life. They're the workhorses of biology. And uh, their function, what they do in the body, partially depends on their 3D structure. And determining this structure experimentally often takes years of painstaking work in the laboratory. Um, and what the protein folding problem is about is, can we 
predict the 3D structure of a protein uh, directly from its one-dimensional amino acid sequence, um, basically a series of letters. Can we predict the 3D structure? Uh, and this was first conjectured by uh, Christian and Fienzen in his Nobel lecture in 1972, and it became a 50-year grand challenge in biology. Next slide. So our solution to this was building our program AlphaFold. Um, and uh, AlphaFold is able to predict the 3D structure of the proteins down to uh, atomic accuracy. So to within the tolerance of the width of an atom. And uh, that is accurate enough for um, biologists for it to be useful to biologists to use downstream for all sorts of tasks, things like understanding disease uh, and potentially designing drugs. So, um, and then over the course of the following year, 18 months, we used AlphaFold, which is efficient enough to predict the structure of a protein in a matter of seconds. We used it to predict the structure of all 200 million proteins that are known to science. And we released all of those structures freely available uh, in the AlphaFold protein structure database uh, that we created in, uh, in conjunction with, in collaboration with the European Bioinformatics Institute. And to date, uh, the, the sort of impact of AlphaFold has been you know, really huge and gratifying to see. Um, there's been over a million uh, researchers have now used um, AlphaFold and, and the predicted structures um, from pretty much every country around the world. Um, and the methods paper has now been cited over 10,000 times uh, in just 18 months. And uh, uh, my biology professors always used to tell me the rule of thumb of finding the structure of a protein uh, in the experimental way, you know, would normally take uh, on average a, a PhD student their entire PhD, so maybe four or five years. So 200 million protein structures represents um, nearly a billion years of PhD time. Next slide, please. And uh, it's been incredible to see actually the the, the broad things that uh, AlphaFold and the structures have been used for in the biological community. So all the way from uh, designing enzymes that are more efficient at eating plastic pollution uh, to drug discovery in areas like antibiotic resistance and ne neglected diseases like leishmaniasis and developing vaccines for malaria to fundamental uh, biology research uh, for example, finding the structure of the nuclear pore complex, one of the biggest proteins in the body, um, and developing uh, new types of delivery mechanisms uh, 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 using protein syringes. Next slide, please. I think this is just the beginning of what we're going to see AI being able to use for science. Um, in the last couple of years, we've had uh, big breakthroughs in fields as far afield as quantum chemistry and um, uh, solving some important conjectures in pure mathematics, uh, controlling uh, the plasma in a fusion reactor um, to works on gene expression prediction. Next slide. So while this is an incredibly exciting time, and uh, I think we're going to see some amazing advances uh, that have been powered by AI in the next five to 10 years, we of course need to be um, very responsible with these technologies. And um, Transformative technologies like AI deserve exceptional care. And our sort of mantra is that we need to be bold and responsible. Um, we need to be bold because of the potential. We need to be brave about how we try and apply these things because of the enormous potential for positive impact these technologies can have. But we also need to be responsible with that at the same time. Ethics and safety has been central to our mission at DeepMind and at Google from the beginning. Um, when we started back in 2010, we planned for success. In 2010, almost nobody was talking about AI. Um, and, uh, and now, uh, you know, in short 10 years, it seems to be the biggest thing that everyone is talking about. Um, but we planned for success and we sort of understood in the beginning that if we were successful as a field uh, uh, with these types of technologies, the impact would be profound. And therefore, um, we had to think about ethics and safety from the very beginning. We've always had an ethics charter, and that's now developed and evolved into Google's published AI principles. And we continue to try and provide sort of responsible and thoughtful leadership on uh, a range of topics from AI strategy to risk to ethics and safety um, in engagement with the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hosavis. And now we'll move to Dr. Lee. 
Hi, everyone. It's a true honor to be here and uh, nice talking to the PCAST uh, and the public. So um, the title of my talk is AI, the Human Impact and Responsibility. Um, next, I thought about um, what am I going to say in five plus minutes? And I think I'm just going to say five sentences. Of course, I'll expand a little bit based on each sentence. So here's my first one. Uh, Having been in the world of AI for the past uh, 20 plus years, as a technologist and scientist, I truly feel we have arrived at an important inflection point, uh, thanks to generative AI, especially language models. Next. And, uh, you know, there are many ways to characterize this moment, but I think you know, you can pick any of your favorite figures. This is one of mine to show you over the past uh, few years, the number of generative AI systems based on mostly language models have really exploded both in terms of the number as well as in terms of the size of the model, as well as frankly, in terms of the impact. Um, so. I know this is just one possible figure to show, but it's really important to recognize that um, this is not just a niche scientific technical moment. This is a moment that impacted uh, the industry and lives in, in a whole. And next, please. Another way to show this inflection point is a completely different um, um, dimension, which is to think about people. And uh, we don't have data for 2022, but if you look at the past uh, decade, the number of computer science bachelor uh, graduates has grew nearly three times. And this is really daunting for those of us working in the public sector, working in academia, higher education. Um, you know, if we don't cap classes, at least at Stanford, uh, my class will be having thousands of students. Right now, my class is capped at 600, but it's just growing and it's incredible. And it's re important to recognize what this means for, for our world and uh, for this technology. So next, please. So the second sentence I want to share, and hopefully is one my second take home message, is that this moment driven by large language model, in my opinion, is just the beginning. Next, please. Um, first of all, it's just the beginning of the, the, the impact of this technology. And uh, here I use another one of the main potential graphs to show that the ecosystem that's going to grow out of this technology of large language model is tremendous. It's increasing every day. Every one of these companies, whether they're serving any verticals you can think of, healthcare, um, you know, um, energy and 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 uh, energy, entertainment, education, um, all these uh, sectors are being impacted. Next, please. But when I say it's just the beginning, I want to remind everybody that intelligence is not just language. There is actually deeply, profoundly interesting technology coming and will be going out of the door soon. For example, in my area of research, which is computer vision and perception based, we're seeing incredible advances, whether you're looking at 3D uh, technology to interpret the 3D world or understanding of human behaviors, activities, poses, or, you know, recognizing and segmenting images based on objects and semantics or the kind of generative uh, art and generative uh, um, uh, simulations like we see in, in DALI and, and all this. Uh, this will unlock even further the kind of impact this technology will have. Next, please. And last but not least, um, in, next, please. In terms of uh, this technology, um, we, oh, sorry, back. Um, we think about AI today as purely digital 
interacting the digital world through languages and pixels and uh, and and other uh, forms of uh, you know digital data but the world is uh, is physical and uh, soon we're going to see the marriage between the physical world and uh, ai especially through embodied intelligence like robotics this is another area both my lab and many of my colleagues are working in so all this is to show you that um, I'm very excited about what is coming for this technology. Next, please. So the third um, take home message I want to uh, say today is about what is this technology for? We hear so many fears, concerns, anxieties of AI. I do want to double click on something that really makes me uh, excited and proud of our work every day, which is AI can be a technology that augments and enhance humans. Next, please. And in this case, I'm going to just show you one example, which is how it can transform healthcare delivery. Uh, we call it ambient intelligence because in healthcare space, there are many, many situations. We don't know what's going on with our patients. We don't know how the the treatment is happening, and we have hard, difficult ways to assess the situation. Next, please. Um, for example, in surgical rooms, we have a tremendous responsibility of tracking objects, tracking small items. It has profound clinical implications for the safety of the patients. And using smart perception, like smart camera technology, can help our clinicians to uh, track and, and automate some part of the, the tedious work that is critical for the safety and outcome of a surgery. Next, please. Or thinking about aging population. I said, next, please. Thank you. Um, thinking about it. Please go back. <laughs> or thinking about aging population. We have a lot of, we have an increasing aging population worldwide. This pandemic has showed us that uh, living independently with quality at home is critical for, for everybody. And we have a lot of potential for this technology in terms of ambient intelligence to help family mem members, caretakers, and clinicians to take care of our patients and elderly. Next, please. So, um, the examples are abundant. If we unlock the ability of AI, we can see profound changes in education, in healthcare, in uh, disaster relief, in e-commerce, and many things to go. Next, please. The next take-home message is, with all this in front of us and what's coming, there's profound social impact. Next, please. I understand the next session will go into deeper dive into economics. Here's just one example of my colleague, uh, Eric Bernofsen's work at Stanford uh, Human Center AI Institute to look at how AI, generative AI language models can boost uh, contact center workers' productivity. And this is the purple curve that shows various ways that uh, it, it, it helps our workers. Um, but the uh, uh, the other uh, side is also uh, important to recognize. Next, please. And of course, it also pro can propagate issues such as human biases we see for centuries. And with this uh, powerful technology, we see examples of uh, biases that are you know, amplifying already the human society biases, and it will get even more deeper and broader by AI. Next, please. So this brings me to this call that uh, my previous panelists has talked about. We must build trustworthy and responsible AI, which includes many different dimensions. I'm gonna, not going to belabor this, but this is why we need human-centered technology, not just AI itself. And next, please. Last but not the least, um, Coming from the public sector and higher education, I think there is profound ways that policy making can help, especially ensuring a better tomorrow. Next, please. This is a graph to show that um, currently 
industry has been dominating AI talent acquisition as well as development. Every one of those curve is showing that uh, we have an acceleration of industry's dominance in the R&D uh, as, as well as uh, talent acquisition of AI. Next, please. And uh, the technology is becoming bigger and bigger and requires more and more resource. And all the red dots of the recent developments, which again, didn't go to 2023, uh, is showing again, the acceleration of industry's dominance. Next, please. But one of the most important thing of a healthy America economy is the importance between, uh, it's a healthy ecosystem between public sector, higher education research, uh, as well as industry uh, and government. This is why we have put in a lot of effort in, in advocating and leading this national AI research resource um, um, a call that hopes to strengthen and democratize uh, America's uh, AI innovation ecosystem. Next, please. This is with the goal of rejuvenating this ecosystem uh, between all these three um, uh, sectors and uh, making sure that we not only develop this technology, we develop this technology for the benefits of humans and uh, responsibly and uh, with trustworthiness. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. And thank you to all three panelists for opening this. I'd like to now open the floor for discussion and uh, include the PCAST members who are on Zoom. So please put up your cards if you have a, a question. Uh, Andrea Goldsmith, please. Thanks uh, to the three of you for an incredibly uh, enlightening uh, set of presentations. Um, Feifei actually answered one of my questions, which was how do we get academia to be part of this uh, technology when the compute resources and data sets are limited. So I won't ask that question. The question I'll ask uh, is really to all three of you. Um, the power of this technology is, is in different domains, including science and engineering and social science, is bringing together domain experts and AI experts, which is hard to do. It's hard to do in industry. It's even harder to do in academia. So how do you view breaking down the disciplinary silos uh, in order to make progress uh, of using this powerful tool of AI in different domains? Um. I can get started. Uh, yeah, so you know, uh, we founded AI for Science Initiative at uh, Caltech in 2018, even before uh, you know AI in the sciences was considered a mainstream topic. And I think uh, you know the important thing that helped is a lot of casual conversations before you go into concrete projects, right? And what was also important is having students with the right mathematical foundations, which at Caltech, we provide the beginning courses, as well as having a foundation in machine learning. So I think a common language and goals that multiple groups can work together is really important. Also at NVIDIA, we've started the Earth2 effort where the goal is to build this digital twin of the planet. And we are collaborating with universities, uh, national and international labs. And I think the key is openness and uh, collaborative mindset is to me the most important aspect. Maybe just to echo that as well, um, uh, as since the inception of DeepMind, we've always been a multidisciplinary research group. Uh, I'm a really strong believer in that, you know, fuels creativity. So um, in addition to machine learning experts and engineers and mathematicians, we've had physicists, chemists, but also social scientists, philosophers and ethicists on the team. And I think that mix uh, really helps uh, the whole group um, be as creative as possible. But also when we pick a specific uh, task or problem to apply AI to, for example, like protein folding, um, we actually go and talk to one or two of, or several of the world's experts in, in that particular domain uh, to really try and understand the nature of the problem, what the keys to it are, and also how much, uh, uh, you know, how much downstream impact would it have if that problem was solved. So we actually, uh, in almost all of our topics we um, that we pick, we work with domain experts in academia 
collaborate with them to actually formulate the problem and also the metrics by which we're going to uh, optimize the AI systems against. Um, just to chime in, I agree with both Anima and Demis. Uh, two things, because at Stanford HAI, we are kind of a microcosm of trying to do interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work. Two things that I find really important, one is bottom up, one is a little top down. Bottom up is that we must have bilingual talents at this point. AI is not just a niche computer science uh, uh, discipline. Our um, you know, medical school students, our historians, our, our economist students, our policy students, um, all these schools and uh, these sectors, uh, disciplines, uh, we are seeing more and more students and researchers learning to be bilingual with this technology. And we're seeing technologists learning to be bilingual with the disciplinary uh, fields. And that kind of training, the classes the, the, is critical to, to ensure this. And the more top-down effort is um, incentives through um, uh, especially research uh, research uh, projects, research funding, and this I think uh, is where public sector can do go a long way is by um, you know our, our federal funding programs as well as our internal ones. We can encourage a lot of uh, great projects through this interdisciplinary collaborations. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a question from Bill Dowie, and then we'll go to uh, one of our PCAST members on this on Zoom. Bill? Yeah, well, I have a pair of questions. I'll ask them together. So the first is, this is a really exciting area. It's clear that AI can do a lot to advance science. And one of the things that appears to be limiting it is the lack of talent in AI. And if, you know, Fei Fei can only have 600 people in her class, that doesn't seem like enough scale to get the workforce we need to really fully exploit um, this opportunity. So I'd like your thoughts on that. And then the second one is, I think a lot of people see the, the benefits of this, but also the potential you know, dangers with, with issues you know, like, like bias, especially being applied to things like you know, setting bails and giving loans and, and the like. Um, how do you assure adequate guardrails for this technology? I can definitely start with the education question, Bill. Um, first of all, I think, um, um, as I said that, um, the, to increase our talent, it's not just computer science talent. I think multidisciplinary talent. One thing that's heartening is the 600 students come from all over the department, especially even like music, philosophy, and all that. So, so I I see that this is a, another area of investment that education. Uh, we must start this kind of uh, computer science as well as bilingual education uh, from. K-12 all the way to um, higher education. Second is that um, I think it's actually very exciting this technology can change also the landscape of education itself. I mean, how many students today use ChatGPT to learn concepts they don't learn in school, right? So we're seeing new technology helping to democratize and boost uh, different uh, forms of education. Last but not the least, I also want to highlight ed education needs to pay attention to diversity and inclusion. And I have founded this national nonprofit AI for All that is focusing on K-12 education for diverse students. And I think this is part of the increasing and democratizing talent that we should pay more attention, especially in a technically driven field like AI that's so important. Thank you. Uh, Joe Chiani on Zoom. Thank you, Francis. Uh, great presentations. Um, I guess my question is, given that you are the leaders in this area, especially in academics, what is happening around the world with AI? And can there be a unified set of ethics? And how would you, how would you monitor for that? Um, uh I, I think you, Joe, you said the word academics, so I'll go first, but I do think industry plays a huge role, you know, as a former Googler, I know that industry is also uh, participating in this. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think it's really, really important to have ethical framework, responsible framework from the very upstream, which is the research itself, 
all the way to the application. And uh, and I think, you know, for example, at Stanford, we're the first university that when we give out AI HAI grants, we actually go through an ethics and uh, a society review board, uh, mirroring the IRB that we have seen medical uh, uh, research. So um, how do we ensure the world has a unified framework? Part of it is leadership. I think those of us who believe in these values need to create forums, create, um, um, you know, framework, create multi-stakeholder um, um, uh, discourse that come together and uh, and uh, uh, work on this. I, I think leadership truly, truly matters and America's leadership truly matters. I wanna say just one thing is, um, of course, depending on whether you're upstreaming the uh, fundamental research all the way to downstreaming application when rubber meets the road, the kind of ethical framework does, you know, there might be shared values, but the implementation is very different. And one thing I personally don't think we hear enough uh, uh, is that a lot of attention is on how to control or even pause AI research upstream, but what about the application when rubber meets the road? We have existing framework, um, you know, responsible framework in forms of say, uh, 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 you know, FDA regulatory framework or a SEC regulatory framework. I think we need to lead there as well and show how we can uh, up, uh, apply these framework to AI impacts and applications. Maybe I can just uh, jump in here as well. And I, I wanted to answer the previous question as well as just a couple of comments on that and as well as the, lo the last question. So just on terms of um, how do we increase the, the number of uh, people expert in this area? I do actually think the master's level, this is what we've um, recommended to UK government who acted on this, is a great place to start. So you could take STEM students and others in undergraduate who've been trained in mathematics and other things, and then do almost like a one-year conversion course. It's very efficient, I think, to create multidisciplinary people who are, who are conversant in both languages, as Fei-Fei was saying earlier. Um, so I think that could be considered. I think that's kind of a sweet spot. Um, in terms of like using these systems, even though, you know, and been being mindful of things like bias and, and, and interpretability, I think a lot more research has to go into these systems to make them more understandable uh, and interpretable. Um, and in the meantime, while we're doing that, my view is that for mission critical uh, tasks, uh, be those legal decisions or medical decisions and so on, I think, um, you, you know, ultimately the decision maker, there has to be a human in the loop, in my opinion, at the current stage of AI development. So it's great to use these AI tools as assistants or, or, or to triage data and things or surface data to the human expert, uh, be that a doctor or a, or a lawyer. Um, but in the end, uh, uh, it, it, the current uh, development and understanding of these systems, I think it should be a human in the loop who makes the final decision. Um, as to this last question of the international norms, I think this is a really, I, I think one of the big problem, the, the sort of big challenges with AI, but it's not just with AI, but it comes to the fore with AI of, of course, different cultures around the world will view things differently about what um, their value systems will be different, um, what should these systems be deployed for and what kind of use cases, uh, and they may not be in agreement across the globe. So the question is, how do we develop these systems responsibly for use across the globe if there is an agreement even between governments and cultures and nations uh, on some specifics about what they should do? So I think that requires some kind of, that's more of a geopolitical question, I would say, um, uh, than just a technical one, really, um, although there are technical issues too. Yeah, I agree with um, everything that has been said. The only thing I want to add is the need for transparency and democratization. Right. So there have been uh, frameworks proposed, like the model cards by Timnit Gebru and Meg Mitchell and um, others, where the goal is to document the entire training process, how the data was curated, what were the biases in data, how the model was tested, you know, what are the known shortcomings of the model, where it should not be used, right? Not just because there's so many unintended use cases once the model is available. And so that's something uh, is a first step. And that's also something that has been harder in the generative AI realm because there's been much more of a closed door policy. And so I think finding ways to uh, 
provide uh, access to these models for academics to study. You know, those who haven't been involved in the process, can they at least understand the workings of these models and study it in an unbiased manner? I think that's really important. I know there is a red team effort that is uh, underway uh, that where many models will be available for academics to study. We need to kind of keep that really up to date and do this sometimes maybe even before certain models are launched. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Would any PCAS members like to respond? There was a lot to unpack there. Paula, you're next, so perfect. <laughs> and then we'll go to Eric. Yes, I wanted to respond on the workforce conversation we're having, especially with respect to education, but I'd love to hear from uh, uh, both uh, of our uh, guests from industry, because I think at universities we're seeing an overwhelming number of students signing up for computer science, but on the other hat side, we also see a bit of a drain in several other important sciences, the molecular sciences, some of the biological sciences, and in areas that are really going to thrive with the application of AIML. How do we address uh, what uh, Feifei so uh, nicely described as this multidisciplinary effort uh, without requiring students uh, to think that they need to get a degree in computer science. I think that there needs to be an understanding that students can gain these skill sets. Would this be something that one might envision uh, as a change in what we think of as the basic curricular requirements for engineering and science degrees? And from industry, I'd love to hear um, how industry thinks about hiring people, because uh, what we hear from our students is that they think they have to have that degree to be attractive to industry. Is there a way that industry can partner with academics to encourage a different model for gaining that domain expertise, but enabling the practice practitioners of that domain to do the programming as well, to understand that they can actually take part? Um, I can start because you know I'm on both sides, uh, so I've seen the, you know, there's a lot, lot of uh, shared uh, notion both in industry and academia. So at Caltech, we have created a data science minor, and a lot of the students across campus are taking that, and we've embedded uh, computer science courses, uh, programming, machine learning into all of the curriculum, and I think that's the goal, right? Not just bring all the students into AI, but just let AI go into every domain. Uh, we also have AI and ethics course. We have AI in humanities for studying social media conversations and other use cases. So I think this is where, uh, you know, by creating a common core of AI for across the campus, uh, we can really be successful. On the industry side, I would say a lot of it depends on you know, whether it's a very much uh, application oriented or a research role, right? So there's a wide range of roles. There isn't one AI role. Uh, but of course, you know, when I uh, hire for my team, I look at uh, the research background and, and as well as programming capabilities. I think that's where there is sometimes a gap because in academia, people don't have access to do large scale computing and all the programming and knowledge needed to train models. And that's very much an important skill needed in industry. So providing that access as well to students from different backgrounds uh, in different regions so that they can be better prepared for uh, these kind of uh, highly in demand industry jobs is very important. I, I just wanna add, um... Here in academia, I personally feel a little more optimistic. Um, this is just my perspective that I think I see a lot of students of different departments and disciplines are taking CS courses that um, will further boost their own disciplinary work and study and research rather than uh, converting majors. I, 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 I do agree with you that um, with better design curriculum and major incentive, we can make sure that kind of bilingualism or, or cross-disciplinary um, uh, uh, you know, uh, study and training is, is further encouraged. But, but I'm seeing, I'm actually seeing the democratization of 
the learning of AI across. What I think it's more important is how do we ensure a healthier uh, collaboration with the industry? I, I, I think um, you know many of my panelists touched on this. I would love to see um, better ways of you know uh, uh, with within the realm of ethics and legality and all that, sharing data, sharing um, you know um, resources, exchanging talents without a more asymmetrical draining. That that's something that in academia we we are concerned about. Demis, would you like yes, to respond? Maybe I to can that? just add, yeah. So I, I think industry um uh can do more, but is also doing quite a lot. I mean for our part, um we sponsor hundreds of master's students actually from underrepresented backgrounds uh, in the UK and elsewhere uh, to do these conversion courses. So maybe they had STEM background and then and then they 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 learn some machine learning. Uh, we've also um, sponsored several chairs in machine learning and, and, and five or six of the major universities in the UK. Um, and then the other thing that we encourage uh, our senior researchers to do is to do online courses. Um, sometimes it usually in collaboration with uh, one of the local universities and they're very, very high quality. And, um, and of course, they're accessible online to anyone. And I think the good news is for any students officially motivated is there are tons of really good resources now online, um, freely available online to actually, or more than most, all the latest subjects in machine learning, uh, if they're willing to put the time and effort in. And there's a lot of open source frameworks that perhaps not at the at the full scale that you might get in industry, but certainly at uh, enough scale that you could um, practice your practical skills to the level where um, uh, you would get you'd be able to uh, get a job at one of the one of the top industry places. And in fact, when we uh, uh, do our hiring, one of the things I've noticed over the ten years or plus that we've been going is that. Um, actually, the people that end up being the most creative machine learning researchers often start actually the backgrounds in physics or mathematics and then learn the machine learning uh, pretty much as they got the job. Uh, and then they come with this other background, this other uh, uh, way of looking at things. And then that actually gives them a new way of looking at machine learning. So um, so in fact, I think any, you know, the, the key the key things are good basic mathematical skills and some good programming skills. Um, the machine learning, I think you can pretty much learn uh, on the job. And uh, most of the companies realize that uh, 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 the raw kind of talent and the energy to to learn about these things uh, and the mathematical and coding skills are the most important. The machine learning, they can actually learn on the job. I wonder if Eric Horvitz from Microsoft would like to tell. <laughs> well, I actually want to ask. Okay, so, you're, so, you're and, next. You can use your time. I, yes, thank you. And, and thanks. Uh, <laughs> Fei Fei uh, and, and, and Demis and Anima for just fabulous presentations today. I want to just get concrete for a minute, minute given all the incredible potential. Let's say take an example of, of what Demis focused on, uh, protein uh, structure and function and the, the prospect. And I ex certainly expect a lot for breakthroughs in the biosciences and, other, and material science, for example, given that work. Um, the other side of the, of the, uh, of the incredible promise is the concern, for example, back to that example, with bad actors hacking biology in ways that lead to devastating outcomes, as rare as they may, may be. So look, thinking about the responsibility we have, uh, we being academia, industry, uh, civil society, and governments. Uh, so taking the, uh, this, the, the, the synthetic bio or the biology, bioscience example in AI as, as, as an example, what should we do to minimize those risks with the lowering of the bar uh, to, to giving these powers to people who might not have the best intentions in mind. And Demis, I know we've talked about this in the past, I think you probably have a lot of ideas, but everybody else too. Yeah, maybe I can just kick off there. So I, I think this is, you know, this is a complex question and a complex issue. It's sort of the other side of the coin of what Fei Fei um, said earlier about uh, democratization and opening up these systems. I mean, of course that's great, we want these systems to be exposed to scrutiny from independent researchers and academic researchers to better understand and interpret what they're doing and test them out in, in deep and powerful ways. Um, so that's important, access to these models so that uh, those tests can be done. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you, you know, the problem is as well is the proliferation of access to these models, say in an uh, unfettered way, maybe open source and other things can have downsides. Because also if you enable good actors 
to assess these systems. At the same time, you're potentially enabling and opening access to bad actors. The sort of unavoidable, uh, those two things go hand in hand. So I think we need to be very thoughtful, actually, about how do we um, give access to uh, the academics and and people researching these these very important questions of safety uh, and, and and understanding and bias and interpretability, all of these extremely important alignment, extremely important topics that we need a lot more research on, but at the same time, not make it really easy for bad actors, whether they're states or individuals, uh, to uh, misuse these same tools. So I think we actually need a more nuanced debate about this. Uh, and, 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 and I think we can work out a, a way to do this. But um, but it but it but it's there's no I don't think it's going to be a kind of easy silver bullet of just like let's open source everything. I don't think um, I think that there are issues, but with 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 those kinds of simplistic answers. So um, you know I think there's a lot of thinking and and policy work actually to do around this. Is that realistic, Demos? <laughs> which which part? The, the, <laughs> having access, free access to academics, but also not to the rest of the world well, yeah i think that i mean look it's hard there are ways to do it i think you know you could give early access um uh under you know we under maybe get get those academics into your office physically or you give them special passwords to these things uh where they can access the outputs they can even publish uh, uh findings on those models but that doesn't necessarily involve releasing the model so mm -hmm. i think there are ways of doing that but it, but but one would have to be thoughtful so that it's um, uh, you know, it's it's accessible enough for the academic doing their work, um, and they're not fettered by those restrictions. But it isn't just um, put out there for 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 anybody to use anywhere. So can can I just add to um, Eric's uh, question? Um, I think uh, I agree with them. It's definitely responsible, you know, sharing and all this. Um, one of the things. At HAI, we discuss a lot is is really about, uh, as I said earlier, there is an urgency of um, using the current regulatory framework. Um, when you are getting into the concrete examples of, say, using, I don't know, AI discovered chemical compound to harm people, I'm just making this up, at this point, it really doesn't almost doesn't matter if it's AI discovered or human created. We have laws and uh, a regulatory framework to make sure, at least to intend to make sure humans are not harmed. And I think it's really important that at this point, it's urgent to look at these existing regulatory framework, update it with the power, you know, knowing what the power of AI is. And on top of that, another very urgent thing, I believe it's important, um, is the, the the education and conversation with policymakers. Um, at Stanford, at least, we try to create a forum to talk to FDAs, to talk to, you know, different agencies, to, to talk to lawmakers, because the more up-to-date and educated um, they are about what this technology is about. The more using Eric's work, which I love, the more concrete and and and, and practical in 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 certain ways that we can uh, respond to this uh, change in technology. Yeah, yeah, I agree with uh, Fei Fei. All I want to add is to you know it's very hard to regulate a general purpose model, right? That can do a variety of tasks. Uh, and again, uh, you know, depending on what kind of prompt or context you give it, the performance will also change. So I agree with Fei Fei to focus a lot more on the downstream tasks. And and now with much faster progress and improved technology, will there have to be more guardrails? For instance, for manufacturing chemicals or biological molecules, you know, does there have to be a more careful regulation to limit dangerous use cases. I think focusing on use cases will make it much more concrete because one danger is trying to regulate a general purpose model, you know, can possibly harm smaller startups and others with not enough resources to go through all those check boxes, right? So we have to balance the two carefully. Yeah, maybe I can just echo as well that I agree with what both Fei Fei and Anima said about 
you know, using we do already have existing laws already in all these areas like medicine, transport and so on. And they need to be probably just upgraded for the new coming AI world in the same way they they had to be upgraded for mobile and Internet before that. So I think that's that's very true. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to point out is actually with AlphaFold specifically and any technologies like that, before we we did open source AlphaFold and all the all the all the protein structures. But before we did that, we spent quite a number of months talking to around 30 experts in different fields like biosecurity, bioethics and, and top biologists to check that the benefits would far outweigh any uh, theoretical risks. And we made some adjustments to, um, uh, based on what they told us, but also they were unanimous that the, 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 the benefits outweighed the risks. So then we put it out. And I think that's the kind of approach we should be taking to uh, all of our big systems and, uh, um, you know, it would be before we put them out into the world. Terence Tao. Hi, thank you for uh, all for your presentations and your the wonderful discussion. Uh, my question is initially for Anima, but I, I think uh, it, it also touches on um, um, Fei Fei's uh, um, mention of the NI, NI research resource. Uh, so I'm, all three of you can chime in. Um, so I'm intrigued, Anima, about your um, proposal for a foundational model for science, if I understand. So is, is this like, is, is the idea to have like something for science, like what chat GPT is for text? Um, and or is it is it just uh, the economy of scale that it, it allows um, uh, researchers access to higher compute and more powerful models, or do you hope to have some emergent synergies, like if a model trains on on all uh, branches of science at once, that there's that there's some some cross uh, uh, benefit, um, or is it just like a time saver that it just sort of saves academics from building their own models? I mean, I, I just like more details about, about what your vision is for this uh, foundational model. Yeah, yeah, no, certainly. Uh, you know, I do think, uh, you know, first of all, it's very important to give academics these resources, right? So, uh, you know, especially in these different domains of sciences and, uh, you know, what we've seen in these AI, lots of applications is AI is enormously speeding up existing numerical simulations. And so that's really a great first step. But what, what I'm hoping is if we can like train these models to understand multiple different domains, think of you know material properties, fluids, waves, you know, do that at different scales from atomic to planetary scales, then you know, I, I do expect there would be an emergent behavior where it can compose and create different kinds of multi-physics and very realistic uh, scenarios and uh, be able to simulate and design on those that is currently uh, lacking because it's just so expensive uh, for current simulations to be even done. I'd love yeah. to hear Demis's the... thoughts on the on a foundational model for science. Yeah, maybe, Fei Fei, did you wanna? Uh, Demis, you can go first, I'll okay. chime in after you. So yes, I, I mean, I think there's huge potential for this, Terence. I mean, uh, I think uh, we're just scratching the surface. I, 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 there's notions of a science assistant, which uh, could be a language model, but obviously would need to have a lot, be, lot, be a lot more grounded and have uh, less hallucinations than the current chatbots <laughs> have. There, there, there wouldn't be much use for, you know, I'm sure you've all tried it, like getting it to cite papers. It comes up with plausible citations, but they're not real papers. So it's very good at doing that. So those things will need to be fixed. But actually, there's some really interesting ideas about learning simulations, like Anima said. But um, potentially reading all the literature in a particular area and then come, and then asking the system to to make predictions or come up with some new ideas. Uh, I don't see why that was not possible. And then perhaps even using things like AlphaFold as a tool. So we're now seeing these language models uh, using tools. Well, some of the tools could also be learnt AI models themselves. More specific tools like AlphaFold uh, being uh, used by more general tools like a language model. So I think there's actually a hugely fertile area to explore here, uh, and we and others are exploring that as to what can be what can be done. And you know, so sorry, just to add a bit more, um, because you can also now think about coupling multiple different such systems, right? Learn from AI, because having climate models now that are much faster uh, with AI-based simulations. But then we can look at the extreme weather events. You know, how will that evolve in the future? And also, what is the impact on renewables? You know, where will there be more wind energy to harness, and where will it be reduced? So it's not even about just one model, but it's multitude of such 
models, right, being chained together. And the other aspect is also the uncertainty quantification in many real world systems, they're chaotic, they're inherently uncertain, right? So having AI learn from data and learn that uncertainty will also help us with risk assessments, which is very different from what we see in text or image models, because there we don't really care about what the true uncertainty is as much as we do in the sciences. And to add to Demis's point about hallucination, this is such a big problem in text-based models. But when we think about um, scientific domains, we have a lot of mathematical modeling. We have equations like partial differential equations, right? So if we can build in uh, those kind of constraints into the model, so it's not just text-based data, we have observational data, we have the loss of physics where we can constrain it, we can add the symmetries, geometries. I showed you the example of uh, the fact that when we are doing a weather prediction, you know, using the fact that there is a spherical geometry and doing the right mathematical basis for that really helped us extrapolate, go beyond what it was trained for, because we only trained it for uh, forecasts of one to two weeks. But then we ran it even as long as a year. And um, you know, naturally, the system gets chaotic, so you cannot exactly track the ground truth trajectory. But on the other hand, you get plausible physics and something that is stable on the longer run. So to me, in summary, it's very important to think about the domain knowledge, constraints, symmetries. This is where domain experts can really you know, bring the right integration also of the existing tools, like how the numerical methods today are uh, done. Um, that's very important to take lessons from that. That's what we did when we created our AI framework called Neural Operator, because we are learning for the continuous process, not just the samples we have. And so those kind of uh, knowledge from other experts and other areas of sciences is very important because I don't think of AI as just a tool that can be applied blindly. It has to be fully integrated with existing workflows, existing mathematical foundations. I, I just want to... Yeah, I just want to chime in for uh, Terence's uh, question. First of all, this latest uh, advances of foundation models, which is large data driven and transformer based, uh, is the latest of the AI science uh, uh, exploration. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that huge data driven, as well as these kind of powerful transformer models are, are creating uh, the, the more newly emergent and uh, generative properties that uh, um, that we haven't seen the previous generations of AI, which means there is a lot we can explore, not just for language. Not, you know, we're talking about different domain. I personally see two things. First, I don't see a singular foundation model uh, that rule them all. <laughs> I think um, I think we're going to see actually a proliferation of foundation models based on different problems and different data. There is going to be multimodality and uh, cross uh, uh, pollination, but that singular uh, unified model, I, I, I'm not seeing strong, necessarily strong evidence for that. Um, second is that um, there's a lot, this science is very nascent, right? Compared to physics and biology. I mean, we our brain works on 40 watts. So I think there is a lot to explore in addition to large models. And uh, uh, I think it's really exciting what we have now, but uh, the science is still very new. Last but not the least, uh, I'll just be brief, that NAIR is so, so, so important, both for the current um, uh, research and education and development of different kinds of um, large data, large resource driven, um, uh, you know, mo uh, models and, and research, but also just for blue sky explorative research that is not going to happen in industry um, in the same way as um, academia. And this is also why we really need this kind of resource to to uh, support this kind of research. Thank you. We're going to turn to one of our PCAST members on Zoom, Vicki. Is that Vicki? Thank you all very much. This has been incredibly stimulating, especially for somebody not in the field. 
Uh, because I'm not in the field, I'm going to ask a forward-looking question. I am curious, as you build more and more complex forward-thinking generative models, whether you are whether you were learning something about how we learn that could be fed back into innate biological systems. So, so we sort of think about, or I think about generative AI as this capability that happens outside, if you will, of, of the human experience. But you must be learning as you solve in increasingly complex problems and create new um, new entities, new products, if you will, something about how people learn and create. Is any of that at a stage where you could imagine going back and enhancing educational approaches or filling in educational or learning learning deficits or barriers in in a way that could have impact back to biology? Yeah, I I think I can s start because I just had a conversation with our dean of education school yeah, uh, just a few hours ago. I actually think this is an area that is extremely exciting. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I think both Demis and I come from some kind of neuroscience background. Um, it's a uh, um, AI inspired human learning or even closing that loop, human learning, uh, you know, inspire AI and coming back AI inspire human learning is actually a very active area of research. At Stanford, um, I'm personally involved with a number of faculty at both Neuroscience Institute, a psychology department, as well as School of Education, we're looking at, for example, how curiosity-driven learning has gotten human babies to, to learn the world in, in very very effective ways. And then you in turn look at how a, a use AI both as a tool to observe human learning as well as a potential um, technology to, to stimulate or probe human learning. Both these aspects of AI can come back and, uh, and uh, influence human learning, especially you know, uh, in, when when you come, uh, come uh, education and learning is such a complex issue. There is, you know, certain different kind of learning about the disability all the way to just, you know, continuous learning. Um, AI is actually a very, very critical tool. And uh, we're seeing this research happening um, already, at least uh, uh, even from HAI's point, point of view, we are looking at more and more interdisciplinary co collaboration between education school and uh, AI faculty. Thanks so much. Just Maria oh. Zuber. Yeah, thank you for the, the great presentations and, and just the amazing insights that you're sharing with us. So I wanna go back to this question that's been touched upon by, by uh, a number of the questions and in the presentations about the fact that most of the talent is residing in industry because industry has the resources, primarily the compute power. And, you know, we're all talking about, you know, the importance of collaboration and the importance of democratization. But the fact of the matter that is that as long as industry has all the resources and all the compute power, the talent is going to keep going to industry. Okay. And, um, and so I, I just want to ask the question, is that okay? All right. And if it's not okay, Whose responsibility is it to, you know, change the landscape of how things go? Is it, is it the government? Is it the government plus industry? Um, and, and where's the right place on it? So just any thoughts that you might have on this, I think I really appreciate hearing. I, I, I can start. I think it's wonderful to have industry. I want to make sure. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it's the pride of a lot of us, our country, you know, that we have such a robust leadership in our industry, uh, R and D and application of this technology. So I think it's absolutely okay that industry is healthy and uh, and, and robust and all this. I. I'll just pretend that you ask the extreme question is, is it okay there's no good thing, uh, AI technology or, or research coming out of academia? Then I would say it's not okay. It's, it's also very, very important that we have a healthy public sector, um, uh, you know, not for profit, 
uh, incentivized AI research because if you look at a ton of scientific and 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 also social science discoveries and understanding of our world um, in human civilization, a lot of them come from non. Uh, profit motives, even AI itself, right? Like this field practically started in academia and a lot of the the breakthroughs we're seeing over uh, the, the, the past uh, half plus century first started in academia. So from that point of view, we will not have today's AI without academia, not to mention so many of the scientific discoveries, the knowledge, understand, and also a lot of the disciplines of studying human society, studying the implications and, and, and thought leadership. So basically, I think it's so, so, so important. Whose responsibility is it? I think it's everybody's. This is why we talk about ecosystem. But I think right now, what academia need, uh, one of the most important thing is the support from uh, the government in terms of closing the resource gap, not to the point that we need to build the kind of large models Demis team is building, but we do need to have that foundational resource to, to make uh, to, to encourage the kind of exciting, vibrant uh, research uh, 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 that's happening uh, in 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 uh, public sector. So I personally do think there's a lot of responsibility um, from the government in collaboration with academia and, and industry. And again, NAIR, I'm part of the task force for NAIR. There we, we discussed a lot about the partnership with industry. So it's not like it's completely isolated. So it's everybody's responsibility, but we would love to see government and uh, support and uh, the partnership of all sectors. Yeah, Anima, you have your foot in both camps. Yes. Maybe you'd <laughs> like to share some of your experience. Yeah, no, I agree with uh, Feifei. It's very important to think of this as collaboration, right? So the large scale projects that I showed you of genome scale language model, weather forecasting, those all came about in collaboration between universities, NVIDIA, also national labs like Argonne National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So in these national labs, we've had the tradition of having supercomputers for a long time, right? And uh, but and now they've been also using it on a lot of AI use cases, including uh, uh, generative AI. Uh, so I think that kind of culture we need to think about for also universities. So what was earlier just the realm of uh, national apps, and it doesn't have to be a physical supercomputer, and that's where Feifei in the near discussions, right, that is both the question of what would be uh, on-premises, what would be on the cloud, and it can be a mix, and also the support, because it's not just providing computing needs, but also the support, you know, because after building all these large-scale language models and image models and NVIDIA, I know it takes a big team, right, and it takes special expertise, so how do we bring that support on to academic projects as well? And how do we build those collaborations? I think one challenge is also to think about the funding process right now. If you think about NSF, DARPA or those, you know, they all fund for a project with uh, personnel and other expenses, but, you know, capital expense of a the scale we are talking about, right? None of those calls uh, really, there is a way to do that. And that's the challenge here because we would need computing for a number of projects rather than one that is, uh, you know, and that way we can make better use of resources by putting them together. And so I think thinking about how to create better funding opportunities for, you know, people to compete on and uh, make the best proposals that are also highly collaborative, what we now think about NSF centers or other such uh, multi-university, uh, multidisciplinary grants, you know, why not also do that around uh, availability of computing resources? I think we need to think about new models of funding. I also agree with you that, uh, sorry, just to add, um, because it's very important to think about, right, things that still seem impractical or not working so well in the current realm of AI. And that could be like working with low power AI, other alternative 
training algorithms. You know, right now they may not scale up to the biggest model or have the best accuracy. So I feel like academia can work on those problems much more uh, with much fewer resources than what would be needed for big models. But we need a seamless mechanism for students and even junior and younger people to be able to access that. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I can just add, um, you know, I think, of course, uh, we, we need both academia and industry. It's just that I think we need to be thinking in academia a little bit more creatively because, uh, and I said this to my academic colleagues too, is that it's, you know, right now the, the, the hot thing in industry is to build the largest models you can, right? And industry is well-placed to do that. Um, so I, if I was in academia, I would look at many things uh, either downstream of that or adjacent to that. So my examples would be, we've talked a lot about interpretability today and uh, analytic tools for what these systems do, assessing them, uh, uh, analyzing if they have bias, uh, what are the right evaluation systems to even evaluate these these criteria against? We don't know those things. Um, so if, you know, there are many, many problems like that, that I think actually would be more well suited for academia to research than industry, because you want sort of nonprofits, non-bias uh, 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 researchers on that. Uh, not just the people that are building those models. Um, and yes, they will need access to those models, but I believe most of the companies will be willing to do that, caveated by what I said earlier about bad actors access accessing it. But I think there are ways to solve that. You could even test those things on uh, not necessarily the, the, the latest frontier models, but still large models, but maybe of the generation back that are freely available uh, now. So, so that you could be very creative today, I think, if there's so many things one could research, in my opinion, that would be extremely useful and extremely valuable to society uh, and that you could easily do uh, 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 in academia without as many um, uh, compute resources. Um, I'd also say that right now, you know, transformers are the, uh, are the fashionable thing and these large language models. But next year or in two years, that might change. It might be something else. And that's something else. Again, there could be a lot of theoretical work or uh, uh, work done on that, that um, academics could do exploratory work uh, uh, that don't necessarily need a, a huge amount of compute. In fact, focusing in on questions like data efficiency learning, so learning in, in, in from, from very few data examples and things like that, that would be enormously powerful if someone were to crack that, but in fact, imply using less compute, right? Not, not the current way that we need masses of data, masses of compute to, to learn relatively simple things. So I, I, I just think it's... It, it's uh, you know, Iman mustn't follow the fashion and actually academia should do what it always does best, which is um, frontier and explore the frontier of the next things that are coming or analyze the existing things and break them down so that we understand them better. I, I would suggest either of those two things would be extremely fruitful. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Bill Press and then Laura Green. Uh, thanks. Uh, so so I want to return for just a minute to the topic that came up a couple of times of hallucination of these models, um, but particularly in the context, it, it also came up of the, the physical models, the fluid dynamics or, or the protein folding. Um, I, I think, you, you know, playing with large language models, I think um, we can understand this sort of semi-popular explanation of hallucination that these models embody some kind of extreme compression of the training data, a lossy compression. And so if you decompress in it, to try to decompress an instance where it actually doesn't have relevant input data, it's going to make something up. And what it makes up is going to be very probable. Um, and, and we see that in the large language models. So, so I'm a little less sanguine um, than, than Anima that um, constraints like symmetries and conservation laws are, are going to um, stop it from hallucinating physical outcomes, because I think it will, it, it seems more likely to me, it will, it will hallucinate physical outcomes, and they'll be kind of mean reverting, they'll be less extreme than they ought to be, because they'll be very plausible. And I wonder if, if you know, in the experimentation on these, well, well, and, and, and why might this be very bad? Because it might underpredict extreme weather events. It might underpredict, I don't know, the toxicity of, of some protein from, from its folding. Um, so, it, it, so it seems to me that one could do experiments on this. For example, um, in the fluid dynamic simulations, 
if you hold back from the in the training data the most extreme events does the model tend to repopulate those events as as it should because they're the the tail of an otherwise well-determined distribution or does it tend to not repopulate them um, um, so so just the, the overall the question of hallucination in in the physical models yeah. thanks yeah i can i can get into that um, indeed, Bill, if, uh, you know, really the AI model is only as good as the data that is fed into it, right? And you do want to give it all the diverse data and the phenomena that you want to capture well. So what we did in the weather forecasting system is we have the wealth of historical weather data, and that is with reanalysis. So, you know, there is incorporation also of physical methods through the assimilation process. Um, and, and by learning on all that, indeed, you know, there weren't many extreme events, but there were still a sufficient number of them. And we tested them on, say, hurricanes, right, uh, outside of the training data set and other such phenomena. And what we are able to see is we are matching um, the metrics that is used in the weather community in terms of medium range weather forecasts that matches, you know, we are able to uh, match those standards. And even like as we train bigger models, we are able to beat them. And at the same time, of course, you know, if there is something uh, unphysical that is seen as we saw when we uh, roll these models out into longer uh, term, then, you know, that's where the symmetries or other constraints, you know, we also know the physics, we know partial differential equations. So we are also incorporating all of those constraints as we go about. So it won't be a purely data-driven model, right? So it, uh, the numerical methods work by solving such equations. So if you're putting that into the constraint, you're saying your model should also be satisfying those equations. And so it's a combination of getting uh, good coverage in the data, uh, right? Incorporating like the right physical constraints and bringing all this together. And also making sure that the model, uh, if it's hallucinating, what is the, again, the interpretability question, right? What are ways to fix that? And I think this is where the right kind of AI frameworks that uh, can really capture the complexity of multiple scales is important. And that's something we've been working on. If I can just add to that, um that uh, and agree like so first of all the first thing you need to do is empirically test against unseen uh, scenarios so one of the reasons we picked protein folding to work on was that uh, there's this uh, amazing competition every two years called CASP in the protein folding world where um, you get given around 100 protein uh, sequences amino acid sequences and the experimentalists have found the structures the real structures but they haven't published it yet so no one knows what they are none of the computational teams know what they are and then you have to predict it and then they reveal, they compare it against the ground truth, the experimental ground truth. So you get, it's a really great test of your predictive powers of your model. And obviously once you get to uh, atomic accuracy on those, on those uh, tests, you can be pretty sure that that carries over to uh, other unseen structures. So that's one thing. The other thing that I think um, is really important is for these systems to estimate their own uncertainty about their predictions. And that's something we've worked really hard on with AlphaFold because we wanted biologists and chemists and biochemists to be able to potentially rely on these predictions downstream for whatever important work they were doing without needing to understand anything about what the model did. They just needed to see the output, the output of structure. And we just, what we did is very simple color coding of the, 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 the uncertainty of the prediction of the position of that particular residue. And um, so you can just glance at, a biologist can just glance at the predictor structure and they can see which parts of the structure um, the model itself thinks are reliable uh, versus uh, uncertain. And I think more systems probably need to include this idea of uncertainty. And in the, um, in the realm of language models, the equivalent would be the model sort of saying, actually, I'm not sure about the answer to this question and just tell you that as the answer, as opposed to trying to make something up that's plausible. Right. If it knew about its own uncertainty, then it would be able to uh, uh, tell you that as part of its answer, or at least give you a clue that that would be the case. Uh, and in language models, the other things we can do is also do things like fact checking or cross checking against known uh, uh, factual sources, uh, 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 you know, whether that's Google search or Wikipedia or, or, or knowledge graphs. So there are actually many ways I think we can we can we can address some of this uh, hallucination problem. And these are obviously active, uh, very active research areas at the moment. Yeah.
I mean, uh, to add to that, uh, I also wanted to just quickly point out that, you know, the uncertainty is especially important in many of these physical systems that can get chaotic, right? So we are not just looking at deterministic forecasts and uh, the metrics associated with that where we do very well, but also asking now if we perturb the system and we look at different scenarios through these ensembles, how well can we statistically predict these phenomena and and it's very important this is where the domain scientists you know working with uh, meteorologists and climate science experts is very important so we are making sure that it's not just one metric that the machine learning system is optimizing for it really is able to recreate or even do better than what the current systems are doing and that's a whole process right we're kind of continuously testing and doing that at scale and uh, so, and after the testing, we can see how we can get big speed ups and uh, along with it, we can do these large ensemble uh, predictions and come up with even better estimates than possible before. Thank you. Laura Green. Hi, thank you very much. Those were uh, inspiring talks and also a little overwhelming. And I have a couple of questions that I think have been answered, but I wanted to sort of ask them again from for my benefit and that has to do with checks and balances reproducibility reliability and regulation i'm a condensed matter physicist and as the experiments get more and more complicated it's harder and harder to get reproducibility and i'm hearing anima talk about you know multifunctional programs and using many many different uh, areas to work together and you know, Fei Fei and uh, Demi, Demis is talking about all the multiple use and bringing them together. How do you check and balance to see that something you're going to use to design a new material, build a bridge, predict a climate change, is not fooling you? And I think that you know, um, Bill touched on that a little bit. But what are the checks and balances for that? And then what we haven't talked about here so much is a little bit in the check and balances and the regulation which is if you try to regulate it, the people using it who don't want to be regulated will be moving along at the same speed. So I guess my question is, how do you fact check and use get the reliability in for when you apply these things to practical applications? So I, I can start. Uh, I want to answer this question in uh... Uh, two ways, because you actually but asked let's make her... the answer short, because we still have a couple more questions and very okay. little time. I'll try to be short. So in terms of uh, check and balances, I want to, again, emphasize on AI is a whole pipeline from uh, fundamental upstream research all the way to productized services and applications and use cases. And I'll just put pick these two points, right? Uh, the very upstream um, university-based, for example, research tends to be very blue sky. There tends to be so far no so-called check and balances, but in our experience with HAI, we have started to building that kind of ethical framework through an IRB-like review process we call ESR, Ethics and Society Review. And that is one kind of check and balances our researchers are doing self-governed um, multidisciplinary uh, review of our own research in terms of the safety, the responsibility, the ethics and social implication. All the way down to the very end, which we talk about, which is rubber meets the road, there, I think governments and agencies and regulatory framework needs to participate in this check and balances that um, is probably in forms of laws and policies and that's a different scale. And uh, to keep things short, I want to also highlight to make an AI system, it goes from data to algorithm to, to you know, how you pack the algorithm for whatever task it does. Along the way, there are many different kind of check balances. Again, just one point, data. Uh, data already needs to be examined. It needs to be, you know, we need to understand the sources, the biases, the privacy issues, and, and many, and, and no matter who is building AI system, whether it's upstream or downstream, these are the different points that we require check and balances both within the organization as well as in the greater context of a society. 
Thank you. I'm going to cut this here so that Saul Perlmutter gets a chance to ask a very quick question. So uh, I was going to earlier ask uh, about the uh, question of when you want humans in the loop, um, you, it seems to me that then you really depend on interpretability um, to, to make any sense of it, because otherwise you're, uh, the humans can't actually do much other than follow the recommendations um, if they're you know, if not careful. Um, so, uh, so I think the interpretability question is, comes back to be a really key one, and I think the mention of the possibility that generative AI may not be the total answer to this. I'm just curious to know for this particular group, are, do we think that the uh, fundings and the and the uh, in, you know, both in industry and and in uh, in you know agencies and government um, is properly distributed so that we'll be getting I know hybrid models considered um, that are doing both some generative but also uh, u using other forms of uh, you know, previous AI as well. Um, so that's the uh, main question, and then the uh, Saul, so you've used up our time with okay. your question. If we have 30 seconds to respond <laughs> so quickly i'm going to say that you know i'm working with surgeons to use ai to help give them feedback during the training process you know for medical students and so it's really interpretability in terms of if there is uh, you know gap in their skill level showing specific grades right during the surgery and and so really kind of going into the interpretability in that specific case so i would say it's really case by case and cannot be a very general notion of interpretability. I'm very sorry, but we have to end right here. This is the wonderful thing about PCAST. It is a group of extremely curious and somewhat knowledgeable people. And we're very uh, uh, grateful to our three panelists. We'll see you shortly. We're going to have a short break and, and come back. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone, bye.
Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone back from our short break for our second AI session. This one focusing on the ways in which AI is impacting society. I'll introduce our panelists and also let you know that additional information on their bios uh, is uh, you can find on the uh, PCAST website. So first up, we'll have Dr. Sandhil Malanathan, and who is the Roman Family University Professor of Computation and Behavioral Science at Chicago Booth, where he's also the inaugural faculty director of the Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence. His current research uses machine learning to understand complex problems in human behavior, social policy, and especially medicine, where computational techniques have the potential to uncover biomedical insights from large-scale health data. We also have Dr. Darren Ashimoglu, who's Institute Professor at MIT and an elected fellow of a number of prestigious American and European scientific societies. He is the author of five books, including a New York Times bestseller, and his areas of interest include the political economy, economic development, economic growth, technological change, inequality, labor economics, and the economics of networks. Third, Dr. Sarah Kreps, who's the John L. Wetherill Professor in the Department of Government and Adjunct Professor of Law and the Director of the Cornell Tech Policy Institute at Cornell University. Her teaching and research focuses on the intersection of international politics, technology, and national security. She writes extensively on this intersection of topics with five books and a range of publications published in prestigious academic journals and premier media outlets. So thank you all for joining us. And I will turn things over to Dr. Molinathan to start us off. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a real privilege uh, to be in front of this group. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, part of what uh, I wanted to do was to just sort of even just set the stage and level set a little bit, because I think when we talk about generative AI, uh, it, it's sometimes easy to just forget exactly what we're talking about and why we're talking about it. So some of this may just be review, but it might be useful to get us all on the same same point. So let me just start with uh, the reasons for enthusiasm. I don't think we would have had this meeting a year and a half ago uh, with nearly the same amount of attention devoted to it. And it's because there's just been a lot of pretty amazing things that have happened in this year and a half. And uh, I think those give us reasons for enthusiasm. So I'm just gonna do that with just some very concrete examples. So. I'll give an example of there's so many things now you can find where people have used large language models. And I'm going to focus on large language models uh, because I think they're the most accessible. They're uh, the ones that have the widest birth. But of course, a lot of what I'm saying applies to image models as well. But let's start with creativity. Creative tasks are the place where you can find endless numbers of examples of this. This is one that I really like. Uh, write a biblical verse in the style of the King James Bible explaining how to remove a peanut butter sandwich from a VCR. And what ChatGPT produces with this is astonishingly good. I mean, it's really good. I mean, if you just read it and it comes to pass that a man troubled by a peanut, the, sand, the, the style is good, the content is good, and the Lord said, verily I say unto thee, seek not to put... So it's remarkable, the style and the content of what's being produced here. And this is, this is a one-off example, but this example is actually pretty generalizable, by which I mean... Some of the one-off examples you see, they're kind of really fine-tuned to say, wow, isn't this amazing? You can just go and try things like this, and it does pretty well. Like, I mean, it'll have failure modes, but it'll work pretty well uh, uh, most of the time. A second example, which I like and hasn't received as much uh, attention, is what I call life admin. Um, Josh Browder, who uh, has an org called Do Not Pay, which is all about helping people get out of sticky subscriptions, which I don't know about you, but I but probably subscribing to eight things that I don't even know I'm subscribing to and continue to pay for. And so here he says, look how I've just programmed ChatGPT to deal with the fact that it's easy to sign up stuff, but when you go to cancel, it's really hard. And so I'll show you a video of what he's done here. 
is him trying to cancel the New York, his New York Times subscription. And this is ChatGPT itself uh, uh, continuing to have a conversation with the New York Times because it's like, oh, you want to you wanna cancel your subscription? Let us talk to you about it. It's not just hitting a button. And now it's actually continuing to have the conversation. What this has done is it's sort of taken something that markets or want to do, which is make things very, very hard to cancel and kind of get rid of that friction. And Josh Browder has many such interesting examples in the financial world that are very much uh, like this. And this is all just chat GPT generated. Um, so another example, which you've probably all seen and is more widely understood is in the world of coding. I just put together a headline here. This is a person who built an entire short game entirely with chat GPT. Now I think here, the reviews are a bit more mixed in that it tends to produce code. I think if you knew nothing about code, you wouldn't really be able to do this. It tends to produce okay code and tends to produce some glitchy code and some things that just don't make sense. But having said that, I think part of what gets people excited is the enormous breadth and just the amazing fact that a, a single chat interface can do these three things and so many more here. But along with reasons for enthusiasm, I think there's some reasons for trepidation. Um, I was trying to figure out how to summarize the reasons for trepidation. And I thought this little GIF is the best one that I've seen. Uh, it's not quite a chat GPT interface, but it's, uh, it's quite illustrative of the kind of basic errors that an algorithm can make. Um, and so I'll give you a few examples of reasons for trepidation that uh, have been discussed. This is one that I just had myself. I merely asked it, chat GPT, hey, what's an easy way to share your output with my friends? And one of the options it gives me is to share the URL of this window. Now you all should just try sharing the URL of your chat GPT window. It is the dumbest idea. Now it's astonishing because this is like not just hallucinating, it's, it's wrong about itself in the most basic use case possible. Of course, you can go in and engineer a solution to this, but it's indicative of how hard it is to output, to get rid of these falsehoods. Of course, the falsehoods are more, are, are more consequential. Here's uh, a Guardian article about how ChatGPT is making up fake Guardian articles, by which they mean when you ask it a question, it'll give citations to Guardian articles that don't exist. And of course, there was this highly publicized case of ChatGPT basically inventing a sexual harassment scandal about a law school professor. Um, you just ask about the law school professor and you get this sexual harassment, harassment scandal. And so I think that reason, hallucination is, is an example, but there are many other such pitfalls. And let me conclude by saying what might be the impact on society. I think Daron will talk amongst other things about jobs, but I think that's been a very common uh, uh, and important area we've been talking about. Um, I think uh, that will, um, Sarah will also um, talk about news and fake misinformation. But I also want to point out there will be exactly because this has many wide applications, there will be many other places. Let me give you an example, going back to the Josh Browder case, where you can see there by giving an interface that can do life admin for you, it has the power to be disruptive of some of the things markets try to do to make to create sludge and make transactions harder or less advantageous to you. There are other examples where if you take these uh, common things where people talk about students using ChatGPT to write essays, you could almost flip that. Is it obvious that that's a bad thing? So for example, if you're writing a statement of purpose or a letter, uh, for a, a, a cover letter for a job, and you come from a family where people have done this many, many times, you get all of this advantageous help of having a sense of what the language of that should look like. If you come from a disadvantaged background, you're the first person to go to college, you don't really know what that thing should look like. And in that sense, ChatGPT can at times be a leveler. And of course, there are many more applications. Let me just conclude by saying, obviously, the question we should ask now is, how do we maximize the, some of the positive impacts and minimize a bunch of the negative impacts? Because as the hallucination examples illustrate, I think the negative impacts are potentially very real. And I'll make three proposals. Uh, one is, even though this is a session on social impact, I think there's a basic research question that must be addressed before we can move on. And that research question is the following. We have a technology here that has very broad application. And we've seen that before. That's, those are general purpose technologies. But what we haven't seen before is that it has unknown and unpredictable failure modes in every one of those applications. 
hallucination is not simply a thing that we can say, oh, well, maybe more data will get rid of it. And we see novel ways of it failing repeatedly. And so what we really need at a foundational level is actual basic science that can answer two questions. What does it mean to evaluate a large language model or a generative model? We don't even know what the task is. In contrast with supervised learning models, they come with their own evaluation metrics. We know that the success of supervised learning was there was a benchmark, an agreed upon benchmark, and people would drive those numbers up. How are we supposed to know what is the metric here? What, what does it mean to have one language model do better than another? The second thing we don't know is we don't really have an analytical framework that crisply is able to understand when it's succeeding and when it's failing. In the last session, there was some discussion about here might be some ways to think about hallucination. I think there was the excellent point about, is it related to compression? But we haven't really fleshed those out and seen if that works and that helps us and that gives us traction. The second thing I think we need is when you have technologies like these that can be used in lots of places, the fear is that it's used by a narrow set of actors. In this case, profit motives, profit motivated actors from the tech sector. I think if we're gonna unleak the positive social unlock the positive social benefits. We need more public-minded innovators that are using these technologies for value added. I, th I thought the Josh Broder example is an extremely interesting one. That's that's an innovation that's aimed at consumer making markets consumer friendly. Um, and I think finally, we need, uh, and Fei-Fei Li addressed this in the last session as well. I think since a lot of these tech questions are fundamentally creeping out of the narrow engineering questions of building LLMs and creeping into the world of how LLMs and other generative models interface with people, we need a better understanding of what happens at that interstitial space between AI and people. Theron will discuss how the automation frame is too easy to fall into. That's an AI plus person thing. But we need other frameworks, I think, that integrate behavioral science with computational science. So let me just stop right there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Dr. Ashimoglu. Thank you, Maria, and uh, uh, it's my true pleasure to be here, especially sharing the stage with Sendel and uh, Sarah. Uh, I couldn't imagine a better uh, group of experts, and I'm going to talk about rethinking AI, and obviously, I'm not an AI scientist, and uh, there are uh, much more knowledgeable experts within this council and in the previous session about the algorithmic and uh, design aspects of AI, but I chose this title because I think we need to rethink what we want from AI, which is inseparable from rethinking AI. The promise of AI, I think the previous panel emphasized it, Sendel emphasized it, is, is, is really breathtaking, and that's why this is the right time to think about this. And uh, the enthusiasm is not confined to... Uh, People in the tech sector, The Economist magazine, uh, for instance, is indicative of the broader excitement and also the view that, you know, this is a benign revolution. Uh, the interpretation so far, new technology has created new jobs to replace the ones that have been destroyed. Imposing heavy regulation seems like an overreaction. And indeed, the possibilities for AI are endless. But We've also seen the dark side of AI, much simpler AI algorithms than generative AI in misinformation, emotional problems that can be exploited by bots and algorithms or platforms, new and more complex biases. Of course, humans are biased, but human plus AI can sometimes be worse. Surveillance and massive data collection uh, which have a variety of pernicious effects have been so far a corollary of the development of AI. Uh, and uh, the tech sector has become more monopolized. But my focus today, as Sendel anticipated, is jobs and inequality. Uh, this is a striking picture some of you may have seen already, but it shows the evolution of shared prosperity in the United States in a rather clear way. I'm depicting here the real weekly earnings of 10 demographic groups, men and women, and uh, all the way from workers with high school, less than high school degree in red and with postgraduate degree in dark blue. Uh, 
everything is normalized to zero in 1963, where this type of data becomes available. And you see a continuation of what was already taking place after World War II from uh, 1963 onwards until the late 1970s. Very rapid real wage growth for all demographic groups. People with less education are experiencing more or less at the same rate uh, economic growth, economic well-being improvements as those who are very well educated. But in the age of digital technologies around 1980, you see a huge increase in inequality, but even more concerning, a decline in the real earnings of low education groups. So for example, the red, orange here, those with less than college degree are declining sharply from 1980 onwards. So this is a very non-shared pattern of prosperity. Of course, this could be a coincidence. This might have nothing to do with digital technologies. And digital technologies could have very different consequences than generative AI. But my work generally suggests that those connections are tighter. Uh, uh, a series of works that I have done with Pascual Restrepo from Boston University suggests that digital technologies used for automation in offices and blue color tasks have be, has been central for understanding the stagnation of real wages and inequality in the United States. So this picture in a crude way summarizes this. Here, I'm looking at the change from 1980 to 2016. So the end points of the figure that I was showing you earlier. And uh, each point here, is a demographic group, a little bit more detailed than the 10 I showed you in the previous picture. So it's distinguished by gender, education, ethnicity, and age. And the size of the circle is the size of the group. And the color coding here shows you the level of education of the group. This is zero. So you see, just like in the previous picture, there are a bunch of groups, a lot of millions of Americans whose demographic group has experienced a decline in real earnings since 1980. And the horizontal axis here is how much automation this group has been subjected to, meaning that what fraction of the tasks that we estimate they used to perform in 1980 have since been automated. And you see a remarkable relationship. Those who have lost real earnings are those that used to perform tasks that have since been automated. And there is a very tight relationship between automation uh, experienced by a demographic group and their real wage change. So the question is whether the information-related, democracy-related disruptions or whether the economic disruptions that I'm showing in this picture are an inevitable corollary of AI. And my argument throughout has been no, there are better ways of doing AI and better, better ways of doing large language models or generative large language models. And whether we choose them or not is a question of business models of companies. And it's also a question of vision. So let's go back to visions of AI or visions of digital technologies. And you can identify two very different approaches. Of course, nobody is at one extreme versus another. It's a mixture. People have uh, elements from both, but those two are really polar uh, opposites. One, going back to Alan Turing and others even before him, and some of the foundational conferences at the beginning of AI is that machines designed by very smart people to be smarter and more powerful than most humans. Machine intelligence, talking of machine intelligence, autonomy, I think are corollaries of this. The alternative is machines to complement you human abilities or machines to be useful to humans. You can think of this as pro-human uh, AI. It starts with an MIT colleague of ours, Norbert Wiener in the 1940s, but Edgar Allan Poe actually anticipated some of this, translated into practice by some uh, very important innovations like by, pe by people like Douglas Engelbart, J.C.R. Licklider, emphasizing human-machine symbiosis, not machines into human brains, but machines giving input to humans, or what uh, the phrase that Engelbart used to use, augmenting human intellect. This requires humans to understand and appropriately use technology and technologies to be designed for humans, not just for automation, just automation is of course part of what we are gonna do with machines, but it's not the only thing we can do with machines. It's not the only thing we can do with digital technologies or LLMs. But there are many roadblocks on using LLMs this way and that's where the rethinking part comes. If we keep on focusing on automation, either as a vision or as because of the business models, this is not gonna work. LLMs remain illegible meaning that what they do is not easy to understand for humans. And I argue that 
this sort of excessive authoritative illegible approach of LLMs really is a major roadblock for it to be useful for humans. Because use, humans cannot become more productive if they get advice from something they don't understand. They have to be able to improve their cognition, their decision making, their understanding in order to be able to use these tools in a versatile manner. And I think the danger here is really, to me, quite uh, present and real. As LLMs become more widespread, this could start a feedback loop that is quite dangerous. If they're not properly understood by humans, if they remain illegible to humans, then you're going to have a lot of ways in which human cognition will be actually reduced rather than augmented. Many examples could be given, and I don't think the one that I'm going to give here is the most dangerous one, but I think it's easy to understand. As LLMs start populating more of the internet, meaning that uh, more posts on social media, more articles, more uh, social media uh, content is generated, at least with input from LLMs, then there is going to be a replication of any mistakes or any biases that LLMs do. So one of it was already picked up in the uh, in the media, Google's Bard and uh, OpenAI, Microsoft Bing, citing each other. But where does this come from? Does it really create a whole of mirrors? Imagine the following. Human queries a large language model. Is policy X effective? LLM gives the answer no, let's say. Future human communication say on social media, policy X is not working. Why is the human saying that? Because with the illegible, excessively authoritative LLM, Humans have only a choice. Either I use and believe the LLM or I don't. If I believe it, then I'm going to parrot it to some degree. But now this becomes part of the new LLM training data for the next generation. Policy X is not working. So these types of feedbacks, I think, are very easy to see as dangerous ways in which human cognition will be reduced. So how to do better at LLMs? And this is my last slide, and I'm going to conclude with this. I think this is a key question. And I think People who understand the structure of LLMs, who are involved in designing the next generation of AI, of course, are going to have better insights of this. But I think as users, social scientists, users, civil society, we have to have inputs into it. And in my role as an analyst of new digital technologies, I think business models are key. Sendel already hinted at this. Profit incentives are great. They are some of the biggest drivers of innovation in market economies. But excessive profit incentives can get can get us astray. So what types of business models we want? Where do you want to get that monetization? Is hundreds of millions of dollars enough or do you want billions and billions of dollars? I think those are questions that are completely entangled with the use and development of these technologies. We also need better architecture. Indeed, if I am even a quarter right that the structure of AI and this legibility is going to be a major determinant of human cognition and human usefulness and machine usefulness to humans, then we really need to think about the architecture of AI. Some elements of this were already highlighted by for Demis, by Demis, for example, incorporate reliability scores, uncertainty together with more accurate sourcing of information. Right now, I think LLMs are not capable of doing this. And if they did it, I don't think it would be reliable because you really need to understand the provenance of information. If two articles have the same source and you cite both of them independently, it's not that you're having two pieces of independent information. So the network of information is really critical and we need to be able to map that in an accurate way within the context of the way we process human knowledge. Allow reasoning exchanges or more interrogation of the uh, of these uh, of these models. So again, authoritativeness, I think, is not going to be good for human cognition. If it's not good for human cognition, it's not going to be good for human productivity, generating new tasks for humans. I think part of the issue is also how you create these foundational models on, so that you can build better human complementary uh, applications. It also related to which type of data you use. I think the current architecture uses a lot of data, but not necessarily high quality data. So uh, again, there were conjectures about whether this is related to the hallucinations, I think those are issues that we really have to investigate. Internal guardrails, regulation, facilitating regulation, all of those are very important. Now, I may have sounded so far as pessimistic, and indeed there is a streak of pessimism when I look at these very promising technologies, but I do believe genuinely that there is a possibility for better future 
positive loops, better architecture of LLMs, enabling businesses to use them more productively and encouraging them to be useful to human, human workers, using them together with electricians, nurses, teachers in a way that amplifies their skills. And the good news is it's possible. The bad news from my point of view is that I don't believe this is where we're heading right now for a variety of reasons. And I think it's going to take a big shock in terms of regulation, in terms of more ethical precepts in how we are using AI for, in terms of development of better ideas and innovations, both in terms of business models and technologies, that sort of big shock will be necessary for us to redirect and, in my opinion, use these technologies in a more human-friendly and more productive way. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the comments and questions. Great. Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to Dr. Krebs. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I sent some slides, or should I load them on my end? They're they're coming. Okay, got it. Uh, well, I will just, in the interest of time, uh, start uh, by saying first, I really commend PCAST for the work it's doing. I think these are really important questions, and, and you've assembled uh, great people, both uh, the members and the participants here today. Uh, so I'm going to, and I appreciate my co-panelists uh, for teeing up some of the work um, that I'll be talking about. And I'm going to organize my remarks along three different lines. Um, and using Sendel's language, I'm going to be talking about first the trepidation, as he said. Next slide, please. So my uh, first is a threat to democracy, which he called trepidation. Um, I'll talk about some of the guardrails against these threats, but then end up on um, uh, uh, an enthusiastic note to think about how these models can be used um, in public-minded kinds of ways. And um, yeah, to do that, just to take a step back here. So uh, kind of, um, and thinking about that first question about the ways in which these technologies might be used or, or, or frankly misused really comes from thinking about the 2016 election. So I've been working in this space since then, but really started at this, this kind of misuse case is what were, what was going on in 2016? And here's what we know is that there was a lot of misinformation and, and, and foreign election interference. So we know there's a, a real misuse motive. Uh, next slide here. Um, we know that they that the Russians in this case were not that good at it. There were ways in which it was pretty clear to non uh, to, to native speakers these little nuances in language. But we also knew. Next slide. As the U.S. government was looking at what had happened in 2016 kind of looking ahead, the Senate Intelligence Committee report said that bad actors will continue to try to weaponize the scale, erode public confidence, and that these techniques would get more sophisticated. Um, so next slide. Uh, it was around that time, 2018, that uh, I went to a presentation by OpenAI, so pre-ChatGPT, but at the time it was GPT-2, and they presented what was very much an early model of this, much less capacious, of course, but also less user friendly. Um, I just came back from the West Coast and uh, it was very clear from talking to people out there that OpenAI I had no idea that this would be as big as it was. And I think because people who have been working in this space have been using these models for many years and no one really seemed to be paying attention. What I think happened here is that it, it is so user friendly. And so it really kind of burst onto the scene, the uh, the most popular app um, and quickest growing app, uh, I think ever, 100 million users within the first two months. But back in 2018, thinking about as, as a former military person, we're always trying not to fight the, fight the last war, but thinking ahead about what could the way, what, how could these technologies be used um, in ways that spoke to the deficiencies of the approaches last time uh, and so this seemed re potentially problematic from a national security perspective. And so I just want to talk very briefly in the next slide about some of the ways in which um, we've worked on these questions, sort of these proofs of concept. Almost, you know, as we think in the national security community, you have to almost think like a like a bad actor to anticipate the ways in which these outcomes uh, might happen and then be able to anticipate and guard against them. 
And so what I've done in some of my work, including with people out at OpenAI, this was from several years ago, and um, I was working as one of the early academic collaborators with OpenAI at this national security space. How do people view this kind of news? Can it scale? Can, uh, can it be misused? And the sort of long story short, as the experiments that we've run, uh, will show is that, and this won't be a surprise to all of us in this room now with what we know about the technology, but even then five years ago, people found we did experiments where we exposed people to different types of either human news, New York Times stories, or the mm. AI generated versions. People just cannot tell the difference. And what I think was foreshadowing of what we are, where we are with ChatGPT is when you ask people, what made it seem like this is a human written story? They say things like, well, the story provided supporting evidence. Uh, they say things like there were specifics and quotes. It seemed plausible. And what we know from using ChatGPT is that it's that plausibility that seem, you know, it seems plausible even if it's wrong. So again, sort of in this vein of, Thinking about the uses and the right here, the misuses, um, what the concerns might be, and what really emerged from this initial proof of concepts of proofs of concept was that the threat might not be that people can't tell the difference. We know that, but if as this content proliferates, they might just not believe anything. And in a democratic society, if people stop believing anything, then it's eroding really a core tenet of a democratic system, which is trust. Uh, so the sort of next stage of this on the misuse, still in the trepidation part, is uh, next slide. Uh, the question of so I, you know, thinking about the 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 public itself, you know, in a bottom up kind of way, in, in what ways they could be manipulated at scale with these technologies. We, I, I was also curious about the political elites themselves and whether this, uh, these technologies could manipulate uh, um, elected leaders through uh, astroturfing and, and creating a sense that there's broad public opinion for something. And again, we know that from 2017, the FCC opened its comments about net neutrality. And what they found was that only 6% of the con comments were unique, which means that someone uh, they someone went on or some group went on to the site and basically flooded it with all the same kinds of comments. So knowing again, what we know about these language models, you wouldn't have those telltale signs because every message could be different. So uh, next slide. Um, just to touch on a little bit of work that uh, research a uh, field experiment. Um, so we used um, chat, uh, sorry, GPT-3 this time to create. So, so we wrote actually with a student, uh, the political union here at Cornell wrote many advocacy letters. We then used that to feed into chat, G, or sorry, GPT-3, these other letters and randomly sent each to um, members of Congress. These were state legislators, so 70, uh, 200 of them. And I do want to note that we had IRB uh, uh, approval to do this. And what we found, um, again, may not be surprising, next slide, but is alarming, which is that um, generally, well, first two things. One is the response rates were fairly low, which speaks to something I'll, I'll talk about in a second here, but also across three issues. Um, guns, health, and schools, the response rates were no different. And so it was very interesting as we debriefed mm -hmm. these elected officials afterwards um, and to foreshadow the public-minded comments here about uh, the positive uses of AI. Several people said, um, and this was back in 2020, won't it be interesting in a world where elected officials, or sorry, AI is interacting with AI? Hmm. Um, and I think we're getting closer uh, to that world. But let me talk for just a minute or two about the guardrails here. And they're not sufficient yet. Next slide. Not sufficient yet, but one place, and I think OpenAI is doing um, as, as good a job as possible about this. I gave it a, I, I tried to get it to write a, an op-ed favoring the pro-Russian position on Ukraine, and it said it cannot do that. Um, 
but you know, these things are, it's a real challenge. I, I was, um, I was giving a talk at Stanford earlier in the week and they were saying, someone asked, well, that he had gone into chat GPT to get tips on assassination. And it was again, in that sort of spirit of understanding the threat and you can still do that, but you know what, you can do that on the internet too. So, um, I think these guardrails are emerging, but the technology is so new and dynamic. Um, it's a real challenge. Next slide. Um, more again in this political space, how else might we guard against these kinds of technologies? And here's an example, you know, people should have more direct contact between their the constituents and elected officials. That seems like a good thing. Um, and so kind of drawing out, not, you know, and another thing is again, calling. Yes, you can do voice clones, um, but I think that's a lot harder because you have one or two phone lines. And town halls. There are other ways to hear what people have to say other than emails. But just to end on a more enthusiastic, a um, technological optimistic note, if you will, is the last slide. Um, and again, as we, as, as some, I was doing some of this research early on, how do we think about using these same types of, of uh, models? to address real problems. Um, and, and if we think about what is a democracy, the a democracy really is about these connections between the government and, and people. And there's a lot, people, uh, people are busy and they need to, elected leaders need to represent their constituents. They're overwhelmed with correspondence, some of which might be inauthentic. And so there are ways to imagine that these language models could be platformed to a detect inauthentic incoming inbound messages, B, then provide a summary. Let's say, you know, I was talking to a member of Congress last week who said he gets 60,000 emails a week um, and he's from a relatively small state. He wants to know what people think. These language models can do that really well and they can do in a very kind of, um, uh, accessible uh, sort of pie figure kind of way what people think, what their people think. Um, and we know in the sort of last case that um, writing and responding, making people feel heard is a challenge because of that inbound problem. So there are ways to think about how generative <laughs> AI can be used in the public interest. And just to close here with the last slide, um, you know, as with most technologies, there are potential upsides and downsides. And I think what we really as a scientific community need to keep doing is understanding that technology and these this, these interdisciplinary groups working hand in hand to understand the science and understand the political and policy impacts and national security impacts of these new technologies. And then targeting internet literacy in this dynamic way as these technologies evolve and then thinking about some of these public minded ways that we can use technology for the good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, lots of questions. We're going to start the questioning with uh, Dennis Asanas. Thank you. First of all, thank you for your stimulating excellent presentation. So uh, I want to start with a question that perhaps can connect a, a little bit also with what was discussed the previous panel and this panel. So uh, you have uh, all articulated that uh, AI is, is becoming more pervasive and it's a tool, a technology, uh, which has both promise uh, and some trepidation, of course, for all of us, uh, the humans. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, how is it best, what strategies would work the best to continue to put the humans in the driver's seat? So, and I will add with that, I mean, I'm especially concerned as an academic, as president of a university, about our future generation. So the place where we build the, the common core, the multidisciplinary skills, uh, all that in the new generation is typically in the gen ed uh, uh, requirements that we have in a lot of the American universities. So I'm wondering, should uh, AI uh, be part of every course that we teach there? Should that be a requirement? Should that be an encouragement so that our students can develop the critical skills, the thinking, everything in the context of an AI informed world. Thank you. Should I answer? Yes, anybody. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so thank you, thank you uh, for that excellent question. I think it has really three layers. Uh, one is, of course, I think if 
AI is going to complement humans. Humans have to be much better at liaising with AI, understanding, prompting it in the right way, not being misled by it when possibility for mis being misled exists. I think the second is we have to identify and build on what we view as unique and very valuable human skills. Uh, I think uh, a lot of my belief in the possibility for human complementary use of AI comes from the fact that I think there are a lot of things that AI cannot do and will not be able to do in the in the intermediate future, not even near future, but in, in, in the intermediate future. And those are very important, unique human skills. The skills that a carpenter has, an electrician has, a nurse, a teacher, an entertainer, a creator. I think all of those things can be amplified. So we have to identify, see which parts of it can be complemented, which parts of it can be usefully delegated. And I think that's both an individual decision for each participant in the labor market, but also a collective decision for society. What are the use, the unique social aspects, communication aspects of human interaction that we value? And then the third is really the architecture of these models. I can see very easily a future in which we push more and more towards automation, even if it's not great. And if the technologies are developed in that automation focused way, all the complementary possibilities would not be feasible. I think there are po possibilities for very bad feed feedback loops. You automate a lot of work. Humans are not given the tools. Humans don't appear very well. And the industry and uh, designers say, oh, look, look, humans are failing. Let's go more into automation. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So all of those, I think, are a part of these three pillars have to be part of the debate. Let's see. I'd like to ask a follow-on question oh, can related. I can I jump in on that same question, if possible? Okay, go go I, ahead. No, um, sorry, I thought we were going around. Um, no, I, I, it's a great question because, um, and it's something we've been, I've been thinking about a lot. I've been teaching this semester a new class on AI law, uh, policy, and ethics, and I was, uh, and I'm also on a Cornell committee that was tasked to figure out how we should be thinking about AI, ChatGPT, these tools in education. And that committee was assembled in January and the, the evolution of our thinking on that has changed quite a bit from at the beginning, there was a thought that maybe we would try to prohibit the use of these technologies in the classroom. Uh, which seemed um, maybe along the lines of the Italian government thinking it could just ban these technologies. And I think the reality is that you you can't. And um, and so part of this assignment actually, and again, as I've been talking to industry, I've talked to law firms this semester, everyone's using it, our students are using it. And so I thought the best way to think about that is, um, and actually I think this is something that one of my colleagues brought up, brought up is I um, asked ChatGPT to create the assignment, the final assignment, um, and built that in instead of trying to prohibit, but help our students think through the ethics of how to use these technologies. And part of the task was for them to analyze uh, where ChatGPT performed well, where it didn't, and why it didn't think it had. And so I think our, you know, as our, our roles in higher education have to adapt as these technologies are adapting as well. And I think a perhaps a more realistic view is not to prohibit them, but to kind of help our students think through how they can use these technologies in, in ethical and productive ways. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask my follow-on question, at, but I'm really glad, Dr. Krebs, that you uh, jumped in there because um, you talked about the necessity of uh, taking into account policy, law, and ethics, uh, which the point is that you can't just teach how to use the program. You need to talk about the broader context. And my follow-on to, uh, to, to Dennis's question was that um, the real issue here in terms of workforce and job loss is with students who don't have a college degree. So, so if we if we really want to uh, hit the real problem in the workforce uh, head on, um, and how AI might be able to help it, we need to start dealing with this at the high school level, not wait until the college level, or else many of the people who could benefit from this will never see it. 
Um, and therefore, we need to infuse things like policy law and ethics into the teaching of, uh, of AI in high school. And that requires training of teachers in many, many more ways than we had ever envisioned. So do any of you um, want to dare to uh, <laughs> think, uh, offer some comments on that? Thank you. I'm happy to do it, but Sendel, if you want to. Uh, uh, go, go ahead, Daron. I can jump in. Yeah, I completely agree, Maria. Uh, I think this has to start in high school, but also it has to be uh, in the context of not just trying to make everybody into a programmer. I think exactly along the lines of recognizing that there are very diverse skills a lot of students are not going to be programmers. They shouldn't be trained to be programmers, but they should be encouraged to develop their unique skills in a way that can benefit from AI. So we're going to need a lot of electricians. Electricians can be much better if they can be armed with AI provided correctly filtered information for diagnosing the problems or helping them. And that does not saying that we should try to make all of them into programmers, they can specialize in their trades, but then understand how to use these tools better. Teachers, I think, as you've already put your finger on it, you know, right now, a lot of money goes into, you know, automated test grading or other things that are going to be cost saving in schools. Actually, we need more teachers that can do re individualized teaching, especially in low socioeconomic background uh, teach the school where with 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 with, uh, with diverse students, and that means they have to use these tools in a better way. But also, they that we need more teachers. So that's the human complementary use of the technology, for instance. Great, Dr. Molinoffin, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I think there are a couple of observations I'll make about the last two questions. But both of them sort of um, about implicit framing of both of the questions. It was it was. Very interesting hearing them. I think I'll start with the, the second question you raised and then move back up. But the second question, as I was reflecting on what, what we would teach, it occurred to me that that frame presumes something, which is that we even know what to teach. I mean, there's just an element right now that there's just confusion at the highest levels at about lots of things here. And I thought Sarah's examples around like if you wanted to teach one basic skill, how would you be able to tell AI generated output from non AI generated output? I think your examples there are really illustrative. I mean, I, what would we teach? And so there's just an element of, there's a step before pedagogy, which is actually deciding what is the true thing? What is the durable, what is the true and useful thing? And I just, I'm, I'm sounding that warning bell, not because the pedagogical component is super important, but thinking about it makes it clear how shallow our existing knowledge base is, even at the highest levels, which means that we need to do something to fix that alongside trying to figure out the pedagogy. And the second point I'll make is rolling back and asking the question, I thought it was very nice in the way it was put is like, how can we put people at the center, people, people back at the center? And that made me think about the fact that, and I'm guilty of this as anybody, I think the, the metaphor that's floating around the back of our heads when we think about AI is something like a tsunami. It's something that's happening to us suddenly and it's big and it's overwhelming us. But I think that metaphor is deeply flawed. It's not happening to us. We are doing it. Individual choices by individual people is creating this technology in particular directions or in other directions. I mean, Sarah and Daron highlighted this. And so in some sense, I think the first thing we should do to put humans back in is to realize we're already in it. We are the people creating this, whether it's a monster or something good. And in some sense, there's a there's a component of we ought to take, figure out who's driving, who's how are we as a collective driving that, and then incentivize that, change that, change the people who are driving. And I think that can be important because I often find myself a little dispirited when I feel like this thing is happening to me, because it's like there's an asteroid coming towards the Earth. What am I going to do? Like, it's it, but it's not we're the asteroid. And so anyway, I'll just stop right there. <laughs> great, thank you so much, uh, Eric Horvitz. You want to go next? Yeah, thanks for the for the great talks, Sandal, Darren, and, and Sarah. 
Um, so, so I deeply agree with what uh, Darren said about uh, the, the upside for human <coughs> AI complementarity uh, and directions there. The, the question I have though for, for him and maybe others can, can uh, add to uh, that, the way he responds is that as you say, um, direct automation uh, of specific tasks and subtasks of jobs is an easier pathway. We can expect to see that uh, in laissez-faire markets. Um, getting to human AI collaboration, as I do enough of my own research, is a, is a challenge, uh, even if the upsides are fabulous when you finish the research. What kinds of, of, of incentives, investments uh, might we need, going back to Sendel's framing just now, to guide um, the way we go with pursuing the harder path to greater excellence when the, when the circuits are shorter to the simplistic automation and we can get locked in there? Um, to the detriment of society. So let me jump in and then I'm sure Sarah and Sendel will have other things to say. I think first uh, we have to start with a perspective change. If you're a manager, you can think of labor as a cost. And if you think of it as a cost, of what you want to do is cut that cost. And automation is one very quick way of doing that. But labor is also your resource. And and the alternative path is to increase the productivity of that resource. I think that's a mindset change. It is partly ethical, but it's also partly about what are the incentives, what you're responsible, what is your fiduciary duty. That needs to be supported by the right sort of incentives. For instance, one uh, point I have made over the years is our tax system implicitly favors automation because we tax capital at a much lower rate than we tax labor. So firms are receiving an implicit subsidy when they use capital to eliminate labor. We also don't leverage enough government leadership. And this is, I think, very important to say in this uh, room. Uh, you know, in history, US government through a variety of agencies has played a major role in setting agendas for the private sector that has then showed amazing creativity in pursuing those agendas. But in the area of digital technologies, I think it's the, the agenda setting role of the government is less. So if the government starts playing that role and pushing more for human complementary uses of AI, I think mm -hmm. that it will follow. But most importantly, I think the industry itself also can prioritize this. I think you can have a feedback loop of a different sort. Managers want automation technologies. The, the industry provides automation technologies, and each side just follows on that path. So that's why I talked of a shock at the end. We need a shock to this feedback loop so we can sort of look at different pastures in terms of how we can use these technologies and what the managers themselves want and what the shareholders want from managers and who the other stakeholders that matter in this process are. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, I might just uh, jump in here as well, because it connects to Eric's question, connects a little bit to something Maria had brought up, which is how the, it's almost it's almost too late by the time you get to higher ed education. We really need to be thinking about mm -hmm. this earlier. And I have kids in K through 12. Um, they're in middle school right now. And I think about the the, the emphasis is STEM, 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 STEM. And it's great. I want to grow that pipeline as well. Uh, but I wonder, and I can see why the emphasis is on STEM, but not just because that's that basic science is so important, but it's also because, you know, how would you frame something, sort of these new ways, new training, the ethics and policy and regulation, those kinds of questions in sort of STEM adjacent ways. No one really wants to be teaching or let alone taking classes on, you know, ethics or STEM adjacent ways. And I wonder whether some of that comes back to industry incentives. I think that some, a lot of the funding for STEM um, programs at earlier ages does come from these, uh, you know, Microsoft and the companies that are really trying to develop their pipeline for students that can eventually go work there. But that could be another, another avenue as well is trying to shift those incentives towards something like the human complementarity or AI trust and safety. And again, we'd have to think about ways to package that to make it appealing. Um, but I think there are ways that that can be done. And I do think that that, that sort of thinking um, needs to happen earlier. Um, again, I hear this a lot from my, uh, my computer science students the, and, and the sort of STEM students more generally, 
can we do, can something be done? Which is a great question, but it's not the only question that should be asked. We should be asking, should it, should, should it be done? Or what are the kind of guardrails if we do go down this road, we should be thinking about at the design phase? On this, on this point, let me just add one, one very minor point about that illustrates, I think, something that Sarah touched on and Daron, you began with, which is the asymmetry in how we treat automation technology and automating, basically putting someone out of work versus how we would treat complementing. It goes back to something super fundamental and it's quite crazy, which is we count physical assets differently than we count human capital assets. Just open up any accounting of any big company. They'll have their physical assets listed as dollars and as assets of the company. The human capital assets are nowhere to be found. That asymmetry is astonishing because it means that if you do any of this stuff that's more complementary, it's kind of off balance sheet. Whereas if you automate, wow, you're saving dollars. And that doesn't just happen at the level of companies, that happens at the level of nations when we count the wealth of nations. So this kind of failing to account for the human component happens in the way we count. I think it happens even before incentives. And I would think policies that change how we count could have huge impacts downstream uh, on a lot of these things. And because we're not going to change anything if we don't fix that. Thank you. Terry Tao. Okay, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful uh, presentations and discussion. Uh, my question, I guess, is mostly for Sarah. Um, so, um, with regards to um, the, the question of sort of um, how can we mitigate the risks of disinformation or treating AI output as more definitive or authoritative than it is, um, you know, we, we can focus on sort of labeling and disclosure type uh, type mitigations. You know, that. that uh, try to uh, um, require AI generated output to be labeled as such and with appropriate um, safeguards and maybe have some certification for when information can be verified. Um, and we can also maybe focus on education of, 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 uh, of, of users. But I wonder if there's anything more we can do beyond just sort of, 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 uh, of education and labeling. I think even like in, in a world where there's both sort of uh, quick and dirty, unreliable information and you know, high quality, but maybe slower and, uh, and um, uh, less somehow um, uh, sexy um, uh, information content. You know, I mean, uh, people will still, may still gravitate towards sort of the lower quality uh, information sources. And so how, how can we incentivize people to, to, to seek out uh, higher quality uh, information? It's a great question, Terry, and it's one that engages with so many different domains, whether it's in, you know, tech or uh, healthcare, you know, with COVID misinformation, politics. And I, so I think these are even broader than our conversation today. Um, but it's something that, you know, I've thought a lot about. And in the AI work I've done, uh, disclosure seems really important. Um, we know from work on misinformation that it really is, um, well, first, we don't always know the uptake of misinformation. Um, and again, I think one of the tricky things is to think about kind of what is our information information ecosystem doing. Um, I was thinking about the um, the the Pope in the puffy coat. You know, I'm sure you all saw the image. And, and my first reaction was, uh, "Wow, he's so stylish." The Pope is wearing a Prada puffy coat. And then, you know, I and I study AI and I study misinformation, and even still, it didn't occur to me. And I talked to my students, and they didn't for a second think it was true, because they go onto the internet anticipating that they're that it's it's full of irony. And they don't go there looking for true information. And so I almost wonder whether part of what we'll have to do, you know, as, as government, as society, is think about other avenues of trust because younger generations coming on coming along don't believe anything until they're convinced otherwise. Whereas I think my generation goes to the internet, sees the puffy coat, and thinks the Pope is um is, is stylist. Stylish. So I, I think there are also kind of new generational issues that we'll have to grapple with as well. You know, in, in again, in that trust and safety kind of issue, you know, our younger generation in other ways we know is being manipulated by algorithms on TikTok. And so in some ways, or, you know, and it's not just TikTok, but it's social media. And so 
how do we think about how those trust and safety issues cross generations? Because there are some areas where younger people are more dubious and more susceptible and other issues where it's the older generation that's more dubious and more susceptible. So I think those are ongoing questions. And again, I, I sort of I favor both conceptual and empirical work to try to, to get at those questions. Thanks, uh, Bill Dolly. Yeah, this is mostly for, um, for Sarah. So um, fake news and disinformation is much older than generative AI, perhaps older than AI itself. Um, is there any real qualitative difference between fake news that's generated by an AI and fake news that's generated by a human? And in either case, are, yeah, what role can tools such as provenance and authentication play in separating the fake news from the real news? Yeah, good question. I think a couple, because I've, I've thought about that a lot and I've been asked that question. Well, we've had misinformation and foreign influence for uh, since the Greeks, if not earlier. And so this is nothing new. I think what's different here is, I think a few things are different. Um, one is that whereas traditional media has gatekeepers, uh, so, you know, not, you, you, you know, you have the, the New York Times as a good example. So they have editors, uh, not anyone can just go publish, but also there's sort of a limit to the reach. And if you think about social media or the internet, it's the ability to post something in a remote corner of the internet and somehow have it go viral. And so it's the, the virality is quick um, and it, it's extensive in, in sort of space, if you will, in time. And so that's something that doesn't take place in, in um, traditional media. And again, kind of a, in my area of work on the national security side, that this openness, you know, what makes a democracy a democracy is if we that we have an open marketplace of ideas. And so foreign actors can enter that marketplace. And a lot of that is good. But that also lends itself to manipulation. Um, and then sort of last, what we know from a number of studies that have been done is that, um, and actually this came out in a conversation I had with the editor of the New York Times, he said, well, we still have to cover City Hall but and then he pulls up the KPIs on his phone. He says people don't read those stories, but we still have to cover City Hall. And the stories that are fake and sensational are the ones that go viral. So I think those are the combination of ways in which these new forms of media create a different uh, a different kind of politics and a different um, vulnerability, if you will, in terms of that that manipulation but, yeah, but i follow up that's the media not the source right so that could be human created content on on that internet media it has nothing to do with whether that content was created by an ai or not that's absolutely right so i think ai what ai does in this case is it does it so you know in, in the work i did with the russian internet research agency um they have a they have a bunch of people sitting in saint petersburg those people um make something like a thousand dollars a month and have to produce these really uh, these really large quotas of content. And when you think about just bandwidth and it's their second language, maybe third, and just sitting there, you know, hour after hour trying to generate content. So that there's this sort of human factor side of things, um, the ESL factor. But then also one of the things about AI that um, is the digital personalization you know, a little bit like the Cambridge Analytica, which is with a lot of data, you can understand how the 18 to 23 year old female uh, market segment thinks about things. And then they can, AI can target that demographic in ways that are known to be more influential. If I, uh, Andre, could I, could I oh, go ahead, I, go ahead, I, Jerome. One thing, I, I, I think one issue is how much centralization of data and information there is. <clears throat> Everybody, I think, in this room understands that there is something wrong if the Chinese Communist Party controls a lot of information and knows via data collection and other tools how they can change incentives at the individual level for political participation. But I think there are parallels if a company or a program has a lot of data about you and knows which buttons to push. That's very different than a lot of decentralized media outlet and some of them have misinformation and some of them don't. So what really worries me about 
the current landscape is the centralization of data in the United States as well as China. And we have to watch out because large language models could amplify that. Great. Andre Goldsmith. Thanks. So this is a question, I guess, partly to Sindhil because he brought it up, but to all the panelists. And this was, you mentioned, how do we create more public-minded innovators? And um, to me, public-minded innovators would be people in universities as well as possibly national labs and uh, nonprofits, and maybe there's other sources. Uh, we know that the resources and the data sets reside primarily in large companies and that much of the research and much of the recent advances have come out of industry. So do you have some thoughts on how do we create and motivate and incentivize more public minded innovators? Um, yeah, I'll, I, I, I think I'll just throw out a few and I'm sure uh, Sarah and Daron have some ideas as well. I think one thing to note is that I do think the government has a huge role to play in that I think a modest amount of resources can go quite some distance in this way. There have been a lot of efforts towards getting people in civil society, getting people in um, uh, students, uh, getting researchers to focus on building things and building things that do good. And that doesn't come at the high price tag that you hear for say building a whole new LLM, because in some sense that that is just building off the chassis of existing models to try and get applications that look very different. And to me there, there's, lots of well-worn examples. Uh, we've had many sort of programs in the past to get members of civil society to participate in innovative activities and try and uh, get that in. I think that would be a very, and that, that to me is at the application layer. At the foundation layer where we're actually changing the core of these LLMs, it is also the case that while I think some of the early price tags were truly enormous, like the amount of money that went by OpenAI into building the various versions of ChatGPT, the dollar price of training has now gone down rad rad radically. And so it's not infeasible for uh, relatively reasonable size uh, grants to aim at building very different looking foundation models. In the previous session, for example, there was a question of a foundation model for science. And that that could be transformative, but that, that wouldn't come at the same price tag as all the investments in it by open AI. So I think that both at the foundation level and at the application level, I think there's a big component of this, which is dollars, um, but then harnessing that dollar dollars to sort of create the right community. Yeah, I think Sendel is absolutely right. It's that it's it's the the fact that a modest amount of resources can go a long way. And if you know, I work with a lot of students who are doing startups and everything is about the VCs, the VCs, the VCs. Well, they have a very different set of incentives and they're good incentives. They're market incentives to try to make a lot of money. But where the government, I actually think, can step in here is to incentivize a little bit what's been done in the, the um, Chips and Science Act is incentivize the kind of research that might not happen in the absence of government incentives. And I think this some sort of analogous thing could be done here as well, is some government support for public-minded inno innovators, because that's not happening in the private sector. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go to Sir Saul Perlmutter. So I think a, a number of the, uh, the presentations all three of you have given um, raise you know, fundamental uh, changes in which you, you'd like to see people restructure how they think about um, certain problems. Um, and I'm just curious whether you think this is going to happen, you know, uh, naturally, um, just evolutionarily, or whether you think that there is actual uh, some need for, you know, more uh, clear policies um, that work on them. You've mentioned one or two of these uh, incentive for certain kinds of research. Um, are there other favorite, you know, ideas and policies that you've, you know, any of the three of you have heard that you feel um, would would be uh, important to put in, or will it? You know, would you mostly wait to see how it all how it all just evolves? If I could, I'll I'll jump in first. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm not a believer that things are going to sort themselves out automatically. Uh, I don't think 
historical evidence suggests that there are powerful self-correcting forces either in the direction of technology or the market mechanism. That's why at the end of my talk, I was referring to a shock. So in addition to the things that we talked about, I think we need a better regulatory environment, better leadership from the government uh, in terms of the direction of research and science. I think we need to rethink about how data is treated. Uh, you know, uh, who owns data, how past contributions and labor in the context of data are compensated. Some of these issues are centrally being displayed, for example, in the Writers Guild strike at the moment. Uh, uh, we have to think about business models. You know, the fact that the market has generated certain business models that are very profitable may or may not be in the social good. For example, a major part of the business models of a lot of companies is through digital ads, whether that's the that's the right model from a variety of social perspectives, I think needs to be decided and discussed. I don't believe so. I think there are lots of problems that digital ad monetized models create. Uh, so I think we, we need to have a much more holistic discussion of where science and technology are going left to their own devices and whether it's fully in line with the priorities of a democratic society. And just as a quick follow-up, uh, do you see those things as uh, have you heard policies proposed that are actually, you know, legislative, or are these things that could be done in, by an executive branch? Um, are, are, practically speaking, are are things not yet at a stage where you would actually recommend, oh, this thing and that thing should be done? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think that they are at the stage of being debated, but we can introduce a digital ad tax. I don't think that is very difficult to implement, and uh, it's not out of line with lots of other things that have been introduced. Jerome Lanier, for example, who was a pioneer in recognizing a lot of these problems well ahead of others, has suggested data unions for people to get compensation and regulate the use of data through market mechanisms. There have been ideas for graduated corporate income taxes that could uh, have impacts uh, across a variety of measures. So I think there are a lot of policies, but I don't see any of them having risen to the top of the uh, legislative agenda yet. Thank you. Great. Thank you. If I can add, oh, if I just add one, I'll add one very quick policy suggestion, which is that uh, I think that we simply have to set up right now before, even if people aren't ready to act, um, and I think that Daron gave some good reasons why they should be, but even if people aren't ready to be act, I think we need to set up already measurement regimes, which we're not setting up right now. In every other sector where there is a genuine regulation, the thing that underlies that regulation is reporting to some authority about some things that we've decided. And right now, like in the previous section, there was a question of, oh, could researchers gain access to some of these models? And that shouldn't be a could. There should be some auditability constraints, and then there should be some decisions. It doesn't have to be researchers gaining, but regulators ought to be able to audit these algorithms. And so in some sense, we need to start setting up the very basic infrastructure of, of reporting and auditability um, if we're actually going to meaningfully make regulation in this area. And I think that has to start happening now. Great, thank you. Paula Hammond. Yes, I'm, I'm really excited about the idea of user uh, informed capabilities and tests uh, for uh, generative AI. But one of the concerns uh, that I think some of you brought up around a bias and around uh, the benefits to all communities is something that's dependent on participation. And it seems that without the participation of underrepresented groups and the formation of these models, as well as in the user-informed aspects, uh, we won't be able to address some of those concerns. So I'm wondering if you have thought about ways in which we can ensure that there's participation from underrepresented communities in each of these different aspects, and, and whether uh, any of those might be deployed and if so how what kinds of policies might help can i speak to that i'm very passionate about that so let me quickly say two things first i'll double down on what you said by just making a simple observation whenever i talk to sort of startups and you look at the problem they're solving it's almost always a problem that the founders personally understand and have 
So now, if you care about the problems of people in the underrepresented populations in poor communities, who knows th th those problems aren't even known to these founders, so they're not going to even think about solving them. So I think representation is such a problem and it cuts all the way down. I think one solution that's very concrete touches on something Sarah said earlier around the VC bias. If if it would not be expensive at all to set up the equivalent of one, two, three, four Y Combinators. This is not a lot of money to set up the equivalent of four Y Combinators, but where the goal isn't simply to have maximum number of uh, IPOs at the maximum price point, but where we have other goals in what we're doing, such as the problems being solved are those of underrepresented communities, underrepresented communities are represented in the founders, the problems have social impact, where we screen on that. It, and Y Combinator is just simply not that expensive. And that had a lot of impact in the private sector. And I think we can do, we can just copy some of the stuff that's worked, but simply change some of the objectives, at least as a first pass. I love that idea, Sendal. And, um, you know, one of the, for all of the reasons you and Paula were just saying, but one of the things, again, that I, I see a lot is if you think about what it takes to be at a startup, you have to be willing to go without money, without a salary for several years. And so what you find then is who's going into startups is people who are coming from affluent backgrounds. Because if you don't, you have to go out and actually make some money. So that Y Combinator idea, again, kind of touches on something we talked about a few minutes ago. This is really where government intervention could be really fruitful, which is shift those incentives, almost like what has happened with summer internships, where there was this realization a few, many years ago, 10 years ago or whatever, that, hey, guess what? Who, you know, who gets to do summer internships for free is this people who, who have money. And those look really good on your resume. And same thing with startups. And this would be an area where now you could do something equivalent on the startup side. Again, not pretty modest amount of money could go a long way there. Can I just add one thing? Because your point is just so great. It it really makes something else I've seen, brings it into even sharper focus. Like I've, I've done a lot of field work in sort of the south side of Chicago. And one thing that's astonishing is just the entrepreneurial drive of people there. And you've all, anyone who's had experience with populations in these backgrounds, these are very entrepreneurial people. So in some sense, their constraint really is the ability to unleash that entrepreneurialism. And I, I find them to be far more entrepreneurial than my undergrads, who all they've done is check boxes on their way into, you know, like these are just people who are like, give me the rule book, I'll follow it. But to thrive on the South Side of Chicago, you have to have this entrepreneurialism. And so it's just, I think it's, I actually think these are the most entrepreneurial communities. And if we can find a way of unlocking what you're saying, Sarah, I, I think there's a lot of talent to be able Thank you. Uh, Terry Tao. So this is kind of a follow on. But as, uh, I was initially interesting for, for, for Darren, but actually just given the, the past responses, actually probably for all of you. Um, so, I mean, Darren spoke a lot about sort of trying to rethink our business models and made a good case that our current business models often uh, past technological improvements that increase productivity, the gains often accrue more to owners of capital than the owners of labor uh, for various reasons, uh, you know, taxation structure and, and business structure. Um, so uh, first question is, 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 did your research sort of show that, that different bot business models did make a difference in how the benefits were, were distributed? You know, do startups or, or nonprofits or, or, or smaller companies have a different way of distributing productivity gains? Um, and uh, second sort of related question and also related to the previous uh, responses is like, could AI enable new business models that don't really, are not really viable right now? Um, like potentially AI could, uh, uh, could a single entrepreneur could, could run a, a medium sized business because the AI could generate, could sort of run a, a lot of the, the bureaucratic and, and, uh, and legalistic type uh, uh, overhead. Um, like, so what, what possibilities are there? Great question. Uh, I My read of the uh, historical evidence as well as some contemporary evidence is that different business models make a difference. For example, uh, students who go to business schools and subjected to different types of ideas about how they should run their business often go and implement that when they lead businesses. So, you know, if you emphasize shareholder value and it's okay to squeeze labor to make more money for shareholders, you know, managers are more likely to do that. If you emphasize, you know, 
let's share some of the gains and that might make workers more productive. More people will experiment with that and the technologies that come with that. But the idea that new technologies create platforms for more diverse ways of approaching problems. I think that's an excellent idea and we have successes. You know, Wikipedia, I think is a huge success in terms of developing a new business model and bringing something that very few people would have predicted. In Taiwan, for example, their digital minister, Audrey Tang, has been at the forefront of experimenting with very different ways of getting people involved in government business, providing feedback. And it's a uh, interplay of new software and models to facilitate that and individuals taking part in that. So I think there's a lot more uh, uh, experimentation to be done there. Thank you. Uh, Bill Dolly. Yes, I wanted to follow up on um, Sendhill's response to Eric's question, suggesting that um, you know companies should somehow you know, record their human capital on the balance sheet, and this would you know create incentives for investing in cooperative AI and human capital rather than just buying capital assets and automation. And my question is, you know, companies can put the capital on their balance sheets because they own it, right? Their means of manufacturing aren't going to walk out the door and get a better job offer somewhere else. Um, but in most places in the U.S., um, people have at-will employees and any day they want, they can give their notice and go get a better job. We actually had a program at my company where we hired people with backgrounds in math and physics, trained them in AI, and then we had huge retention problems because all of a sudden, they could go out and get much better pay than what we were paying them, given their previous background. So do you have any ideas on how companies can practically you know, put human capital on the balance sheet? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's, it's such a great question. And the good news is um, this is something that accountants have spent a long time thinking about. And it goes back to a core fundamental question in accounting, which is if you do something like cash flow accounting and you're just counting the obvious physical things, then there's no judgment calls. It's just you're counting the dollars. Um, but the minute you start trying to count anything even slightly more intangible, there has to be a set of rules that come into play. So let me make a concrete example. Suppose you own a patent. You're going to have to value the, that patent as an asset and put it somewhere on the books. But valuing that patent as an asset doesn't has actually has some of the same issues you just raised. Someone else could come up with a patent that then makes that one obsolete, which is like turnover of your employees. So typically what accountants have started have been doing for the last 40, 50 years in valuing intangible assets is saying, look, we're willing to put intangible assets on the books, but we have some guidelines and rules around how you do that. In your specific example, I'm not an accountant. I think my financial life makes that abundantly clear. But the, the, the kinds of rules that you could imagine coming into place would be something like, we know the average turnover of employees in this category. So that's the depreciation rate, you know, things like that, which would Notice, actually, further the incentives, because if you do the kind of things that make employees want to stay with you, then that would actually further reduce the, quote, depreciation of this asset and increase your asset value. So I don't. I think there is enough precedent that I, I think this problem, we have some guides for how it might be solvable. If I, if I could add, I think, I mean, those are excellent points that Sendel is making, but I think it goes beyond accounting. Again, it actually intersects with business models. In the US, it's absolutely true. You're 100% right. It is a real concern that if you train workers, especially in generalizable portable skills, they will go ahead and take them somewhere else. But in Germany, for example, companies spend millions of dollars training workers in very generalizable industry-wide certified skills, but then they have a system that creates a lot of upward mobility for those workers, creates very good conditions in the firm, and then many workers actually stay uh, in a more cooperative environment. So I think the broader business model actually matters here, whether you have kind of a more stakeholder led type of approach in the firm or not. So again, it intersects with the broader issues that we're talking about. Great. Dr. Krebs, do you have any final comments here? Not on that. I felt like um, in the spirit of uh, comparative advantage, I would leave that question to my economist colleagues. Great. <laughs> okay, well, we've, um, We've we've come to the end of our time here, and um, and I'd I'd like to close by thanking all of you. But you know the one observation that I have from all of you, both in your presentations um, and in the ensuing discussion, is that while we're talking about AI, 
Um, all of you emphasized the criticality of placing humans at the center of the discussion, the, the incentivization, um, the applications. And so, um, so I think certainly we're taking that away and, um, and clearly that's, we're gonna be thinking a lot harder about this, but, um, but you, you've certainly uh, given us some very powerful examples and insight um, into, um, into where this needs to go to really help people because President Biden, every time we talk to him, the emphasis is always, what are you doing? What can we do to help Americans more? And, um, and so I'll close by thanking you for that. Um, so um, I wanna let the public know that um, the recording for this event and the slide presentations that our panelists use uh, are gonna be available on the PCAST website by the end of the month. Now, we did not receive uh, any request to present public comments prior to the Federal Register notice deadline. However, PCAST did receive um, a number of email responses to the AI blog post that our working group put out. And, um, and those materials have been shared with PCAST and we anticipate that there will be uh, vibrant public comment um, in time for our July PCAST meeting. Mm. So, um, so I think we can end there. Francis, do you have any comments that you'd like to add? I just want to, I want to thank the speakers and PCAST uh, for this marvelous session, reminding us to put humans in the middle. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.